Hey guys, how's it going? This is Kevin Asani, and you are watching The Progressive Square. So glad to have you guys with me today. Um, we have a, a lot of interesting topics to cover today. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know before we get started here, just to check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash prog blacksmith. If you could please become a, con a, be become a contributor and um you know become a patron uh that would be very uh, much appreciated uh so let's get started here uh as you guys know many uh many of you guys know that um bernie sanders obviously was in the second night of debates uh when all the democrats faced each other um Obviously, they faced each other in the first end of debates as well. That was ten. That was a group of ten, uh, ten Democrats on the first night. Group of ten Democrats on the second night. Um, and there was obviously some pol uh, poll numbers that came out, uh, as as is the case with uh, every debate that happens um, these days. There's always uh, polls that get released afterwards. People kind of get an idea of how well the polish the politicians did after um, you know after a, uh, after the debate takes place, and then they kind of get an idea of where they are in the you know kind of in the standings, I guess, kind of in a in a in a ranking kind of way. So uh, Bernie Sanders, I think he did a decent job uh, during the debate. I don't think he stood out as much as he wanted to. He kind of let Kamala Harris go after Joe Biden a lot. He uh, seemed to kind of stay in the little, kind of stay in the background a little bit more. Not really uh, make himself heard as much. But when he was making good, you know, good statements, he was definitely, you know, he was definitely speaking up, you know, speaking up and speaking loud and making sure he was heard. But he was definitely not uh, the main guy, you know, making all the noise. Uh, that definitely was going to more towards Kamal Harris, much more towards um, Kirsten Gillibrand, a little bit of Julian Castro, Eric Swalwell. Those three are not very, you know, they're not very high in the polls, but they definitely tried to get a lot more attention. So, um, but either way, um, as much, uh, you know, as good or not good as Bernie Sanders did, that didn't really seem to matter to the mainstream media as usual because they decided to portray Bernie's, um, Bernie's campaign currently as this doom and gloom situation where he's not, um, you know, he's supposedly not doing very well, even though he's still doing very well in the polls, at least majority of the polls. Um, I've always maintained that we need to get through at least, we need to get through at least, I, I would say at least two debates. And, and, and I mean, like, in, at least in the case of Bernie, he needs to get through two debates, two debate, not two, two debates total, especially considering there's more than 20, you know, almost 20, I think 25 candidates running. So that's, it's important to kind of, you know, make sure that each candidate goes through at least two debates before that we really start to judge them big time but you know not surprisingly the media is already jumping on the um doom and gloom bandwagon for bernie so uh, we have a couple of articles here that i'm going to go over well, uh, the first one here is from cnn this one just lays it out you know just lays it out uh, very just bluntly bernie sanders 2020 is in big trouble and this is an article written by Harry Enten. This is a guy that used to work, I believe, for 538 with um, with uh, Nate Silver. And both of those guys are very kind of fake, I, I would say like fake um, poll expert type guys. And they like to just kind of, they, do, they like to uh, judge everything based on kind of like their view of analytics. It's nothing, nothing is ever really kind of like factual and based on like what are the policies of this politician they just kind of say like oh okay well where is he in the rankings or where is he in the you know the poll rankings and then we'll just be, we'll judge it based on that and then right away we're going to decide that this person in this case bernie sanders is not doing very well um it does you know they put aside whatever his performance was they just go based on the polls so let me just go through the article here uh it's not too long and um i'll analyze it for you as we go uh, as we go uh, go through it here so let's check it out 
It says Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign is in trouble. While much of the attention in post-debate polling has focused on the drop of former Vice President Joe Biden, Sanders' polling looks far worse. Sanders' Iowa and national polls are quite weak for somebody with near-universal name recognition. Sanders was at, four, at just 14% in CNN's latest national poll. That's down from 18% in our last poll. As, as important, Ber, uh, Sanders is now running behind California Senator Kamala Harris and Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Harris has 17%, uh, Elizabeth Warren 15%. These are candidates who have lower name recognition than he does. It's not just the CNN poll either. Sanders does, doesn't look much better in Quinnipiac's latest poll, which puts him at 13%. A poll released Wednesday morning by ABC News and the Washington Post did, not, did have somewhat better news for him, putting him at 19%. Second behind Biden among Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents, still an average of the three polls out this week puts him at 15 percent history has not been kind to primary run, run primary runner-ups of previous primaries polling this low of a position i went back and looked at where 13 previous runner-ups since 1972 have been polling at this point in the primary all six who went on to win the nomination were polling above uh, Sanders' 15%. Indeed we, indeed, we can widen it out to see how perilous Sanders' position is among all well-known candidates, only 9% polling uh, at between... 10% uh, and 20% at this point went into went on to win the uh, the nomination. So 9% of the people polling have uh, been between that have been 10 and 20%. So only 9% have won the nomination when they're polling between 10 and 20%. And Bernie's is at, Bernie is at 14. Um, it says early, the early state polling is not much kinder to Sanders. A new Suffolk University poll has a 9% among likely Iowa Democratic caucus goers. The first in the nation contest for Democrats is probably a must win for Sanders. He barely lost it in 2016, yet he's behind Biden. 24% Harris, 16%, and Warren, 13%. It doesn't seem like there is a reservoir of support available for Sanders either. A mere 6% of likely caucus goers say he is their second choice. All told, only 14% list him as a, as a first or second choice. Worse for Sanders is that he seems to be slipping in Iowa. That 9% for first choice is the first is the worst he's done in any Iowa poll since at least December. Uh, now it's not at, uh, now it's not as if Sanders is disliked. According to our CNN poll, Sanders still overwhelmingly holds a positive rating among Democrats nationwide. The problem for Sanders is that there are a slew of alternatives. Warren has co-opted much of Sanders's message. Additionally, Harris seems to seems to hold her own among liberals as well. Neither Harris nor Warren have to deal with the stench of the nasty 2016 primary. In fact, there doesn't seem to be any sign from Sanders that he has healed the wounds of the 2016 primary. You can best see this in the endorsement primary. Pretty much all successful previous runner-ups do a good job of capturing, capturing endorsements from members of Congress and governors. Sanders has the endorsement of just one member of Congress outside of Vermont. The good news for Sanders is that he has a ton of money. He raised another $18 million in the second quarter of 2019. Sanders also has a lot of uh, fervent supporters. That means it'll be difficult to to run him from the race. That base looks to be uh, not large, though. We've uh, obviously got a long way to go, but Sanders 2020 seems looks to be in major, major trouble. So, I mean, he's putting out a bunch of poll numbers here and or, you know, already trying to portray Bernie as just, you know, because he's down, uh, you know, I don't know what the biggest one was. Uh, what was it? Nine percent? Was it nine percent in one of the polls? Yeah, nine percent behind Warren, which is only she was ahead by four points at thirteen percent. Kamala Harris at sixteen percent. I mean, the like that was one poll, and then another poll has him just one point under. Um, let's see, one point. What was he at? Fifteen percent. No, he is at, no, he's at third, what is that, 13%? Yeah, so 13%, um, I'm sorry, 14%, and then 14% in the polls, in uh, one of the polls, another one of the polls, which is only 1% behind Elizabeth Warren, and Harris at 17%. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot of this talk is just, 
I mean, Paul talks these this early is just way too. It's way too hard to really predict where um, where where we're gonna where we're gonna be headed um, when you try to kind of analyze and nitpick polls too much. I even even the, even the polls that don't look good, uh, whether they look good for Bernie or don't look good for Bernie, I don't li really like to focus on them too much because I think a lot of them are oversampling too much. They were definitely doing that, doing that with a lot of polls before the, uh, the debates where they were oversampling boomers a lot and then a lot of the boomers are in favor of Bernie Sanders. I'm sorry, they're in favor of Joe Biden a lot more than Bernie Sanders, so de they're definitely much more pro-Biden for sure. Um, that was one example that kind of stood out to me where I kind of just I determined that I'm just not going to like really like put a lot of emphasis on the polls out there but you know it, it's definitely important to for, for Bernie Sanders regardless of where he is on the polls to make sure that he um, does you know focuses on you know he focuses on making sure that he does you know he continues to push his message and make sure that he um you know, makes his makes his voice heard, and you know, uh, that's what I'm saying. Like in the first debate, he wasn't really heard all that much, and Kamala Harris was definitely heard. Elizabeth Warren was center stage in the first debate, which did not involve Harris, uh, which d did not involve Harris, Sanders, or um, Biden. So Warren was essentially by herself being um, considered one of the more well-known ones, I guess, among the pack of 20, however, 12 or 20 or however many people, 25, you know, can. It's been that case 20 because there was 10 and 10 the first night, 10 the second night. Um, among those 10 that were with uh, Elizabeth Warren, um, they were pretty unknown. They weren't re really well known at all. And um, Warren was definitely the the one that kind of uh stuck out in that pack the most and she did really well she was by herself and she didn't she, she didn't get attacked um she in my opinion received a lot of easy easy questions they set her up for you know msnbc the moderators and stuff there they set her up to get very kind of like soft belt softball type questions nobody was going after her whereas bernie was you know eric swalwell went, went after bernie a little bit um I think it was Biden and Bernie kind of went after each other, but Biden really didn't really go after Bernie that much. But the the fact that Bernie stayed back a little bit more and let Kamala and Biden go at it and all that stuff, that stuck out to voters. And Warren, like I said, was by herself, so she kind of got to get in the, ahead in the polls because she wasn't being attacked by anybody. She was by herself, and she was kind of just putting that message out there. She even said how she supported Bernie's plans, and, you know, she... Um, you know sounding very progressive even though in my opinion she's not really that progressive and she is getting a lot of favorability from um at least much more favorability than you would expect from uh the wall street crowd and the corporate donors and stuff out there um they're, they're warming up to her a lot more there's articles that have been put out showing that regarding uh, elizabeth warren um and you know that's definitely helping her and you know when it comes to the corporate media when they see how much the corporate donors are warming up to her the corporate media is not going to be too tough on her especially calling her on uh, calling her out on medicare for all and wall street uh, wall street uh, you know reform and all that stuff you know if she says she's in favor of wall street reform that's fine but then when she goes out there and puts uh you know is all you know kind of like uh, chummy with the <clears throat> with like the you know different ceos like jamie diamond who's the head of uh who's the ceo i think of um uh jp morgan you know people you know people like that um you know that's going to uh that's going to the, make the media just go a lot easier on her and she's going to have a lot easier time um in general in, in running this in, in general in run when running in this primary um, Bernie has a lot more uh, to go up against because he has the entire establishment against him. He has 19 other candidates, you know, at least 19 other candidates against him. And they're going to, you know, even though they're going to be putting a lot, as they did in those debates, both debates, a lot of the debates they said, you know, well, yeah, well, we would agree with Bernie. We agree with Medicare for all. We agree with, you know, college, you know, free college. And then, now granted, not all of them were saying that, but um, a lot of them were definitely... They were um, trying to kind of, they were kind of trying to uh, co-opt, co-opt his, his, his messages, his, his, at least, at least his, 
you know the messages that he puts out in his policies and kind of trying to seem more populist and but you know honestly a lot of you know progressives like myself and other progressives i know out there they, they're not falling for that kind of stuff and they know that they know that um that's not really going to fly and a lot of times they um you know they try and they try and portray themselves as being just like bernie or they're going to be sympathetic to bernie and uh, honestly it's just it doesn't really it 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 doesn't really sell very well to progressives but there are a lot of other voters out there and bernie is going to have to appeal to them and i and i feel like he will i feel like bernie's going to do a good job with that and he he definitely has um uh, you know he has populist support when you have that populist support you're able to kind of uh reach out to regular people and bernie is definitely like that for sure um i just wanted to go through one more article here um where it talks about bernie's uh stance in the polls it says uh this is an article from the hill uh, the other article was from cnn by the way if, if i didn't mention this one is from the hill it says sanders is slip sanders slips in polls raising doubts about campaign um, Senator Bernie Sanders is slipping in polls following the first Democratic debate, raising questions about whether he can recapture the insurgent energy that nearly carried him to the party's presidential nomination in 2016. Three new polls released after the de first Democratic debate uh, show Sanders falling into fourth pa place behind former Vice President Joe Biden, Senator Kamala Harris, and Senator Elizabeth Warren. A fourth poll released Wednesday morning, uh, Wednesday morning as this story was published found Sanders retaining his second place standing behind Biden. Uh, the ABC News Washington Post poll found Biden in, in the lead at 29%, followed by Sanders at 23%, and Harris and Warren lagging at 11%. Uh, the Sanders campaign says those counting him out are once again underestimating a candidate who surprised the political world three years ago and remains uh, a small dollar fundraising juggernaut with uh, an enthusi enthusiastic core of supporters. Sanders has an inexhaustible base of grassroots donors that will churn out tens of millions of dollars for him as long as he's in the race. On Tuesday, the campaign announced that it raised $18 million in the second quarter, collected from about 1 million donors, giving an average of $18 a piece. Nearly the entire amount came from donors who will be able to give again. Wow, that's impressive. It says many of these donors are blue-collar voters who will be pivotal in determining the outcome of the 2020 election. Teaching is the most common profession among Sanders donors, and Walmart is the most common employer, according to the campaign. And while most of the buzz coming out of the first Democratic debate centered around Harris and Warren, the Sanders campaign said that it had its second place, second best fundraising day of the year the day after the debate, bringing in $2 million over the course of 24 hours. I th um, quoting, who is this here? This is quoting Fast Shakir, which is his campaign manager. It says, I think many of you were wondering whether the Sa Bernie Sanders campaign would persist and how strong it would be. There have been moments where I think people have written off the campaign. I think one of these, uh, one of those moments was after the debate. Uh, we felt very good about his performance, and the numbers indicated we were generally right about that. Um, but Sanders' rivals are stepping up to challenge him, including Warren, who is trying to overtake him as the party's progressive standard bearer. Harris's star turn at the debate vaulted her into direct competition with Biden for the top spot in the field, while South Bend, Indiana Mayor P Pete Buttigieg outraced Sanders in the second quarter. Um, it says, uh, quoting a Democratic strategist here, John Renish. Bernie didn't scare anyone away from jumping into this race, and now he comes out of the debate, um, out of the debate, um, with the worst possible outcome. Nobody is talking about him. In 2016, he benef benefited from being the only alternative to the establishment candidate in 2020. The entire political world has changed except for him. His biggest problem right now is that he looks like a candidate of the past, and that's not a good place to be. Okay, the people that are making these arguments, I'm going to get to a, a segment in the next one where people are making this same stupid argument when Ber Bernie is supposedly too consistent, and that means that he's not, you know, he's somehow not evolved because he's the same as he was in 2016. It makes no sense, so I don't want to get into that 
um, into that, uh, you know, into that rant just yet. But that's the claim, a lot of the claims that they're making, and I'll be covering that soon. But I mean, that's just that makes no fucking sense. I, you know, these people, you know, they're they're trying to come up with like every possible lame, you know, weak attack against Bernie. Well, at least they are lame and weak. But you know, they don't think that. But they think it's going to stick to say that he's not being or that he is consistent. So yeah, that's just ridiculous and. Um, a lot of these democratic strategists don't know what the hell they're doing. They're just kind of clueless, and they're all they care about is all they care about is is just like you know the optics of like pushing cert you know any kind of like you know bullshit talking point that they can come up with and anything that you know that can appeal to like the kind of the Bernie hating type of Democrats out there, the people that are not very pro bernie but they're going to be like oh whatever like anything that they hear you know that's anti bernie they'll you know they'll love it pretty much um the rest of this article you can read it, it it's basically just going over some polls and um it quotes a couple of other pro bernie people um i think and then another uh, strategist who says that sanders you know doesn't have much of a chance but you know it's pretty much the same kind of stuff you guys can check it out i'll put the link in the um I'll put that link in the in the description box below so you guys could check it out. And but it's just, you know, typical Bernie hating. It's it's nothing really that surprising. Um, these people shouldn't be taken seriously at all. A lot of them are just your your typical kind of clueless democratic strategists and people that don't really care about policies. They just care about how you look in like a debate and how you talk and if you're using the night that you know using the right you know inflections in your voices and your hands are moving right the right way and you're talking very passionately but they don't really care about the policies ultimately to them the policies doesn't mean anything because then you know if they end up you know putting out a policy that is too progressive then they know they have to commit to that policy and then they're going to be worried about how that supposedly plays you know in a you know ultimately in the general election when you know like they're pretty much like scared of being too lefty or too progressive and they want to be more centrist so in this regard it's much more just like you honestly you just have to wait for the next debate to happen because i guarantee you bernie sanders is going to pour it on a hell of a lot thicker in the next debate i don't know when that next debate is going to be i have to check but it can't be too far out maybe like a month or so from now and you know bernie sanders is going to make his voice heard and he's going to definitely come come out guns blazing a hell of a lot harder than he did in this last debate so if they want to rule him out they want to they count him out and talk about doom and gloom about him uh, you know that's fine but that's not really going to be the case and i think the bernie sanders campaign themselves know that as well so i have a another art uh, another kind of topic to cover as far as um uh, bernie's you know kind of the anti the anti bernie um rhetoric out there from the mainstream media and um it's not really it, it's not really all that surprising it's kind of the same the same stuff um that you know we we, we saw in the last you know you guys heard me talk about in the last segment and um a lot of it is it, you know it a lot of it is bullshit as usual it's not really that surprising it's the same kind of it's the same kind of stuff you're going to hear um a lot of the you know pundits and you know msm outlets and stuff put out there um so i'm going to play you guys a couple of clips and uh you'll kind of see what i'm talking about here uh the first clip here is going to be from msnbc it's um hardball hosted by chris matthews and he has two guests on one of them is a former um hillary clinton um staffer i don't know strategist advisor or something and the other one is a um a journalist from reuters the publication reuters so let me play this clip for you clip for you guys it's about two minutes just over two minutes long and we'll talk about it on the other side Check it out. That's right. They were on the same page. There was the same perception. I think it was, it was such a clear moment. Um, it's harder to suss out some of the losers. I think Bernie uh, is a great example of a place where 
everyone wasn't sure what to make of his performance. I sort of thought he faded into the background. Uh, he didn't have a big standout moment. And his polls have sort of uh, faltered a little, but not monumentally. Didn't you think so it was a replica of, of uh, uh, Bernie being Bernie? Like if, if, it was all, if there were a hall of the states for losers that lose these <laughs> elections. You know, no, he's not a loser, but he lose elections. He would be behaving like that. Automaton. That was Bernie being Bernie, the way that Larry David portrayed him. I was him. just going to say Larry David, Chris. No, I think it, with, it, with one other candidate in the race, Bernie being Bernie was fine in 2016, or rather it served him well. But on a stage with nine other candidates and with now 25 people in the race. Um, You're you know, so smart. You know, that's, I mean, that's exactly Whenever somebody says something, I've been thinking better than I do. I thought it's very hard to talk revolution when there's nine people around you. They're not in the revolution. How do you claim there's a revolution going on when you got all these Andrew Yang and everybody else there? Well, and also, Bernie's also saying the same thing he said in 2016 this time around. I think that's not working. That's exactly the point I was going to make, is that he, America has evolved in the last four years. People's perspectives have changed. Bernie Sanders sounds like 2015 Bernie Sanders. Has, and if you've, if you've expected some evolution and you haven't gotten it from him, uh, a lot of people will scratch in their heads. Has he been stolen his life? on the left because you've got Kamala, much younger, mm -hmm. talking pretty hard stuff, pretty strong, progressive stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got Elizabeth who's been out there for four years selling it, and she says it in a somewhat more subtle way. I'm not a socialist. I'm a Democrat. I, I believe in markets, but I want to refine them. I want structural change. Very carefully calibrating how far left the country's willing to go. Still, Bernie's out there with the old left. Yeah, I think so, Chris. And I also think that voters know that Bernie Sanders has been talking about these same policies essentially since he's been in public service for the past 25, 30 years. But he actually hasn't done anything to pass them, right? He's talked a lot about them, but we have not seen any of these policies signed into law. So you've got Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, new senators on the scene who I think voters are looking at them and saying, you know what, we may these ladies may actually have a chance to get these policies passed. Yeah, so that's just typical kind of... MSNBC coverage right there as far as I mean they were they were pretty anti I would say anti Bernie for short in 2016 and I mean if you watch anybody pretty much anybody on that channel I mean the most the most anti Bernie type people are definitely like the Joy Reid types and to some extent Rachel Maddow but I mean Maddow was Maddow in 2016 was much more just pro Hillary than anti Bernie but now like the type of people that watch Rachel Maddow, that watch Joy Ann Reed, that kind of just watch MSNBC in general, definitely are not are not fans of Bernie Sanders, and that's because he supposedly cost Hillary Clinton the election or whatever bullshit like that. But um, it's you know, and th th these talking points are ridiculous. Talking about how he's too he's he sounds too much like 2016. They literally they literally like. Uh, they're uh, contradicting themselves. They're saying he's too much like 2016. In other words, like claiming... So, in other words, he sounds the same as 2016, but then he hasn't evolved. But why would the why would the candidate with the most left-wing, most progressive, most, they even say, socialist, can, socialist policies, why would he have to evolve, quote-unquote? What is he evolving from? His policies are already far to the left. If you want to claim that he's evolving to the, what well, he has to evolve to the center all of a sudden now, he's running for the Democratic nomination. He's running for the, you know, he's running as a progressive. If he's going to ev evolve from something, what he's not going to evolve from being a left winger. He's already a left winger. If anything, all the other candidates haven't evolved. So that talking point just makes no sense. You know, they're, these people are talking out of their ass. It's, it, I mean, that's. I guess that's what you should, what you should expect, not just from MSNBC, but you know, just from like mainstream media journalists, so-called fake. I don't know, journalists, fake news, phone, fake journalists, basically. You know, I don't want to use the term fake news because Trump uses that, but that's a different story. But anyway, yeah. But like these faux journalists, like these, they don't. They are, they're totally out of touch. They, and like their attacks on Bernie just. There's, they've gotten so bad, and you know, as I was talking about, you know, earlier, it's just a lot of these, a lot of these, what these so-called journalists say is just bullshit. You can't, you can't buy any of this stuff. It's just they, they come up with like the worst arguments against him. It's even worse than 2016 because they threw the fucking kitchen sink at him in 2016, and now they pretty much have nothing left. So they have to just pull things out of their ass and just come up with like, oh, okay, well that makes sense because Bernie supposedly hasn't evolved. But let me play one more clip from you, one more clip for you guys right here. This one is from 
a, a conversation that Chuck Todd was having on his show Meet uh, MTP da Daily, which is basically the week the weekday version of Meet the Press, which is usually on Sundays, but he has a weekday version, and um, it's basically the same exact thing. He just brings guests on to talk, and so he br uh, this time he brought on Marcos Melitzas. This guy, I'll get to him in a second, but he's the uh, I'm going to tear, tear him a new one in a second, but uh, he is the uh, founder, owner and founder or operator of um, Daily Coast, which is kind of a irrelevant, these days at least, an irrelevant kind of progressive blogging you know, publication. So let's see what he says here. What do you make of the Bernie Sanders observation by Doug Thornell? Has, has Warren basically eclipse Sanders in your world of sort of progressive, um, fundamental economic change politics? Yeah, absolutely. The problem with Bernie Sanders is that he has the exact same message he had four years ago. And that message didn't get him to victory four years ago. Not sure why he's not trying to calibrate that, particularly in his field. And one of the arguments his supporters make and the campaign is making, too, is that everybody is, quote, stealing his message, as though maybe Bernie invented liberalism. But point aside, <laughs> Bernie deserves a lot of credit for mainstreaming a yes. lot of those ideas. But he has done nothing to build his own base of support. And why stick with Bernie, who's as divisive as he is, when there are more appealing, uh, inclusive candidates uh, in the field? And there's a mm -hmm. bunch to choose from. Marcos Melitza is one of the most annoying anti-Bernie, you know, the resistance type of, you know, characters out there. Um, he just sounds totally smarmy and entitled. And he just has like this attitude of like, you know, how dare Bernie Sanders, you know, come into this primary or pr come into this, you know, Democratic Party. And uh, how dare he try and overtake it? He says some nice things about their, you know, about Bernie being like, you know, mainstreaming these ideas. But then he's kind of saying like saying the same exact thing that they were saying in that in that other se other segment I just played for you guys where you know he hasn't changed since 2016 and he whatever he hasn't evolved and he hasn't he's, he's the same guy like that's the point we like that about Bernie Bernie Sanders remaining the same guy is a good thing and he says like oh he Bernie Sanders you know created liberalism nobody's saying that nobody's saying that Bernie Sanders is the only progressive that has ever existed ever they're just saying that he is the most progressive candidate in this race regardless of what other rhetoric the other people are saying regardless of that bernie sanders is the most progressive candidate in this race he's the he's been the most consistent for sure he's stated the same views that he did since 2016 he hasn't so-called evolved all the other candidates are the ones that have evolved to him to him they're the ones who were pushing you know their corporatist ideas um you know however many years ago two years ago a year ago even until they decided oh you know what i better start sounding more like bernie sanders or else i'm not going to get those progressive votes and you're probably not going to get the, the they're probably not going to get those progressive votes anyway if you're actually you know a real progressive so if you're a real progressive like myself and you know you're you know going to be voting in the general election i'm not going to be voting for kamala harris i'm probably not going to be voting for elizabeth warren either and the only people i would be consider voting for would be bernie sanders and tulsi gabbard and but when it comes to Bernie, he has been consistent for a reason, and that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. So when you want to pretend as if he's, as if you know he's doing something bad by repeating the same, you know, the same ideas and the same, if you want to say, slogans and talking points as he did in 2016, then that's a good thing. If you have an issue with that, then you're just again, as usual, they're trying to. They're trying to uh, pretend as if, you know, Bernie Sanders, you know, is, is you know, not, he's not part of the mainstream because he's not, you know, because he's, I don't know, he's divisive or whatever. Like, okay, so somehow you're divisive, even though all the other politicians on that stage, all the other candidates are repeating the same ideas as he is. But all of a sudden he's divisive? So, so I mean, honestly, people like this are just stuck in 2016. 
These idiots are just stuck in 2016 worrying about all the shit that happened there where Bernie Sanders had the nerve to um, push for more progressive policies. He took the took the crown away from the anointed Queen Hillary Clinton. And, you know, he he had the nerve to run in a primary, which is totally legal. It's He's not doing anything wrong. He's not doing anything unethical. He's not doing anything legal. He's doing what... what people wanted him to do now whether people say you know he should you know he should run as a you know third party candidate okay people honestly there's even democrats who have made that argument these are the same idiots that said that that say that jill stein and gary johnson running as third party candidates which was green party and libertarian party they're saying those third party candidates stole the votes away from hillary clinton in 2016 yet they say oh well hillary you know bernie sanders should run as a you know bernie sanders should run as a third party candidate because he shouldn't come into our democratic party because it's our party but then when he runs as a you know then when he um runs as a democrat um you know he's he's trying to move the democratic party to the left that's exactly what every honestly politician that runs for the you know in the democratic party should do but apparently they have zero interest in that because they're so focused on uh you know sucking up to the to the you know, corporatist donors out there, essentially, the, the you know, rich donors, whether they're celebrities, whether they're, you know, big banks, oil companies, all the people that are going to, you know, the military industrial complex, all the people that are going to add more money into the coffers of the Democratic Party. No, you have to cater to those people. Those are the people that you should care about. Those are your constituents, not the actual constituents out there who are the American people, who are the people in the Democratic Party that are progressive and um, believe in ideas like medicare for all and free college uh, a living wage ending the wars um you know m pushing for more unions uh you know more unions uh, that, that to exist and have more power and uh you know all that stuff it's it, like apparently pushing for those kind of things is not you know it's a litmus test as they claim and it's the wrong thing to do because you need to do whatever the democratic party says says and wants you to do and I mean, it's, again, like I said before, the stuff that they're throwing at Bernie Sanders right now is a, I don't know, it's more of like a, it's, it's kind of like a recycled version of what they were doing in 2016, because they had nothing to say, I'm sorry, they had everything pretty much to say in 2016, and they have nothing to say now. So now it's just kind of like, oh, okay, we don't have much to say, but let's find something, you know, let's find some ch as, you know, che cheap ass attacks, just as much cheap ass attacks as we did last time, but not as many because we threw everything at him before. So this time around, let's just come up with, you know, the best thing we can that's, you know, hopefully going to stick because, and then on top of the fact that, you know, there's a lot of other candidates out there, that's something they keep mentioning. And you know like there's a lot more other candidates that are sounding like him so they must be the better choice and since he's divisive and he sounds just like 2016 he's not that appealing even though he's the most consistent candidate on that stage saying the same exact things as he was saying in 2016 all of those things are popular all of those policies are the things that progressives want even though these you know these other candidates supposedly have those positions even though they didn't have them in 20 you know in 2018 20 you know 2017 2016 whether or not they were candidates or not you know but as far as like the policies that those candidates believe in believed in then they you know claim the fact that they claim to believe in in them now it's honestly no progressive or leftist believes that because honestly you know because obviously they're I mean, they're opportunists and they're just pushing, you know, they're just pushing for whatever policies that will cater to the voters out there so that they will vote for them. Um, but the reality is, is that a lot of us are not as stupid as they think we are. They, we are not as gullible as we were when somebody like Barack Obama was, uh, was running and he was talking about hope and change and he was giving passionate speeches and he was a, a, a black man who was, you know, who sounded, you know, you know, really ar articulate and was saying all the right things. And, you know, we were coming right off George W. Bush. Granted, in this case, we're coming off of, or we're going to hope to come off of Donald Trump. Hopefully, this is going to be, he's not going to get a second term, regardless of, you know, whether or not I, you know, who I support in the Democratic Party, whether or not I support the Democratic Party. I do not want Donald Trump to have a second term. But regardless of that, um, you know, it's, it's not, doesn't mean I'm going to vote for those candidates. But like, you know, even if we're coming, we're going to be coming off of Trump, 
presidency, that doesn't necessarily mean that all the progressives out there are just going to fall in line and do whatever the Democratic Party says. It's not going to be that easy. And if they think it's going to be that easy, you know, they're going to be dead wrong on that one. They can fear monger and all that shit as much as they want. But at the end of the day, we want a candidate that's going to be a real progressive, is not going to be a progressive in, you know, in name only, you know, a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's what a lot of these candidates are. Aside from Bernie Sanders, Tulsi Gabbard, and, you know, at least, uh, you know, if you want to throw Mike, Mike Gravel in there, maybe. But every other candidate, including Elizabeth Warren, in, in my opinion, are not, they're not trustworthy to push for the real progressive policies that the progressive, the progressive movement and progressive voters want. So the next... Um, the next thing we're going to talk about here is uh, related a little bit to Bernie Sanders, but it's also involving, it's, a, it's also a little bit related to um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but it's a mainly about Bernie Sanders. Uh, I'm sorry, not Bernie Sanders, but um, Joe Biden. I already said Bernie Sanders. Um, it's, it has to do with Joe Biden going after, um, going after progressives and... Um, kind of trying to downplay their ideas and, and pretending as if their ideas are um, too radical and not, you know, saying how pragmatic he is, you know, how pragmatic Bernie, uh, I'm sorry, how pragmatic Joe Biden is and that his ideas should be championed a hell of a lot more than what Bernie Sanders and AOC and, you know, Ilhan Omar and all these other justice Democrats, you know, those type of people that are pushing for. So Joe Biden gave a speech to... Um, not a speech, I'm sorry, he gave an interview to CNN where he talked about, he talked about that very issue. He talked about, um, well, the progressive issues, at least. In this case, he was talking about Medicare for All and um, at least the, um, you know, the main progressive ideas that are being advocated for by um, progressive politicians and progressive um, you know, activists and everything out there. So he uh, was talking to Chris Cuomo and let's uh, let's check out what he says here, and then we'll talk about it on the other side. How do you convince the party that these more advanced ideas, like all in on Medicare for all, that I matter call to them? them advanced. I oh, would they're call popular them, in the party. Well, by the way, watch. That's what this election is about. I'm really I'm happy to debate that issue and all those issues with my friends because guess what? Again, look who won the races. Look who won last time out. We had, and by the way, I think, I, I think Ocasio-Cortez is a brilliant, bright woman, but she won a primary. They're, in the general election fights, who won? Mainstream Democrats who are very progressive on social issues and very strong on education, health care. Look, my North Star is the middle class. When the middle class does well, everybody does well. How do you do better for them economically, if Number, not with these 70 percent tax rates? Well, Three things. One, I do raise the tax rate to 39.5%. I do, in fact, eliminate the ability for them to write off capital gains the way they do now. I would raise the, and raise billions of dollars, raise the corporate tax rate from 20 to 28%. It was 36 to 28%. That raised billions of dollars. Trump will say, but I, that's what brought the economy up to where it is, is those tax cuts. Ask these people who work in this restaurant how that economy came up for them. Ask them how good they feel about it. Ask them how the stock market is really helping. Ask how driving this $2 trillion greater in debt has done anything for them. So, I mean, typical Joe Biden putting out his uh, shitty policies out there, but he's also shitting on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and downplaying the fact that she... Um, you know, the fact that she won a primary but didn't win a general election. And he talks about how, oh, the, you know, the... You know, the, the main people that won general elections for the Democratic Party are all, you know, mainstream type, polit you know, Democrats and politicians. Okay, that's not a good thing. Uh, as much as you think it is, it's <laughs> and, and to and to act like AOC, you know, oh, she just won. She, you know, she only won a primary. Yeah, she won a primary against a guy that was out raising her by like four to one or three to one. And, you know, that was a guy that was, you know, in that in that seat for, I don't know, 20 years, I think, near close to at least at, at least I would say at least 
six or seven terms, eight terms maybe. And he was like, he was uh, considered the person to kind of the next person to take over for, for um, Nancy Pelosi. He was going to be her like, ex essentially Nancy Pelosi's successor. And that was Joe Crowley. And this is who AOC beat. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez beat a guy that was guaranteed to win. He was guaranteed to win that seat. And, I mean, Joe Biden is just talking about her as if she's, as if she's, oh, well, whatever. She's a brilliant and bright woman. And, but, you know, you know, she won a primary. But then, okay, so, but then, and then he talks about how, you know how the the his north star is the middle class but then you're taking all this money from all these corporate donors and you're doing fundraisers with you know cor you know for, for with you know you know the heads of the, the CEOs of you know big multinational corporations and then you're going out there and telling them how they're victims as we've covered in past uh past uh, podcasts uh, you know for this for this show and you know he's going out there and doing fundraisers and telling them telling the rich how they're not enemies of anybody and they're how they're you know great great people and then he needs them and then now he talks about how the door the middle class is his north star get the fuck out of here man you're not you're not that the north star for you is the is the you know corporate donors that you suck up to on a daily basis and those are the people that you care about so um let, let me read an article here from newsweek um which uh talks about how Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are um, kind of um, pushing back against Biden's, you know, pushing back against Biden's a little bit, you know, Biden's slight there, you know, where he kind of went after them a little bit. So let me uh, read this one for you guys a little bit. It's a pretty short article. So let's check it out here. It says that it's from newsweek.com. It says Bernie Sanders rebuffs Biden's uh, Medicare for All criticism says he and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are working for agenda uh, that America needs. Um, it says Senator Bernie Sanders rebuffed 2020 rival Joe Biden's criticism of his Medicare for All health care plan and argues that he was uh, working alongside fellow progressive lawmakers like Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to create a political agenda America needs. Biden had told CNN in an interview that he believes a more moderate Democratic candidate will have the best chance to take down President Trump, Donald Trump, during the 2020 general election. The former vice president argued that most Democratic voters are center-left, uh, not way left. And then... Um, quoting Biden, as you read in the article here. I'm sorry, as you, as you heard in the, in the interview here. Um, he says, look, who won, la who won last time? Out. And by the way, I think Alexandra, I, I think Ocasio-Cortez is a brilliant, bright woman, but she won a primary. In general election fights, who won? Biden told CNN's Chris Cuomo, mainstream Democrats who are very progressive on social issues and very strong on education and health care. Look, my North Star is the middle class. When the middle class does well, everybody else does well. Um, or everybody does well. Uh, Biden also swiped at Sanders' Medicare for All Universal Health Care proposal, saying that he has a plan that's, uh, quote, rational and will cost a hell of a lot less. The former vice president said he would not eliminate private insurance like the Sanders proposal intends, but would offer Medicare as an option for anyone who wants to buy into the system. So Biden supports a public option, essentially, which is, which was pretty much the the furthest thing that the Obama campaign was uh, willing to support and was pushing for when Obama was not the campaign, but the Obama when Obama was president in 2009 ish, 2010 ish, when he was somewhat on board with the idea of Medicare for all, he was like, Oh, okay, but let's do a, you know, public option. And that's like pretty much, you know, that was because he knew that the health insurance companies would obviously not support Medicare for all and universal universal health care. So he was like, yeah, let's push for a public option because that's going to be most um, feasible to the to the big, you know, to the insurance companies and big corporations, whatnot. So. Um, it says, uh, continuing on with the article, it says, Sanders quickly rebuffed Biden's criticism in a Twitter post Friday, writing he is, quote, proud to work with uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez to craft the, quote, agenda America needs, and the one that will take down Trump in 2020. 
and this is quoting uh, Bernie here, at this is tweet. It says, I'm proud to be working with at AOC and, and so many other Democrats to pass Medicare for all, debt-free college, and a Green New Deal. This is the agenda America needs, and that will energize voters to defeat Donald Trump, he wrote. Uh, said Sanders has often had to defend his socialist policies through the 2020 primary race. During the first Democratic debate, candidates like former uh, Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper and Senator Michael Bennett took aim at Sanders' bold proposals, like the Green New Deal and universal health care. Um, it says the bottom line is if we don't clearly define that we are not socialists, like, uh, the Republicans are going to come at, uh, come at us every way they can and call us socialists, Hickenlooper said. Sanders fired back, giving his relatively high poll numbers to refute the criticism that his proposals are too radical to win over American voters and defeat Trump in 2020. The last poll I saw had us 10 points ahead of Donald Trump because the American people understand that Trump is a phony, that Trump is a pathological liar, and a racist, and he lied to the American people during his campaign. Uh, that's Bernie Sanders saying that at the debate. Um, the last paragraph here says, Since launching his 2020 campaign in February, the 77-year-old senator has steadily ranked among the top Democratic candidates in early polls. Real Clear Politics average of national polling shows Sanders to have 14.2% of support, placing him in third place, uh, third, third place behind uh, former Vice President Joe Biden and California Senator Kamala Harris. So Bernie Sanders is not, he's obviously not willing to take any shit from Joe Biden here. He is happy to stand up for Ocasio-Cortez. He's happy to stand up for the ideas that he believes in. And that's, as usual with Bernie Sanders, it's great to see. It's not um, definitely not surprising he is not the kind of person that is going to be bullied around and told that he, um, that, you know, that his policies are not going to work. And, uh, you know, that's the days of doing that. The days of, of letting that pass is not, it just doesn't exist anymore. And the Democrats that are running, especially Joe Biden, especially Kamala Harris, um, Cory Booker, I mean, those guys are, those those people are kind of, they claim to be in favor of Medicare for all, but they're really not, um, as we profiled um, in the past, especially with Kamala Harris, for sure. Um, Elizabeth Warren claims that she supports different paths to it, so does Kamala Harris. Um, they've gone back and forth on those policies many times, you know. Elizabeth Warren, to her credit, has been consistent in not supporting not supporting Medicare for all. She did support his um, his Medicare for all legislation when um, you know in the Senate and everything. But as far as like saying like yeah, we just you know we are in support of Medicare for all. You know all that stuff. Like you know it seems like Kamala Harris is the one that has flip flopped the most on that, um, as well as like abolishing private insurance and stuff like that too. Um, we're going to be getting to how popular that actually is, abolishing private insurance. So that's going to be shown on the shown in one of the segments later on in the show today but um but yeah i mean elizabeth warren has she she has she's always kind of talked about like yeah i support a path to medicare for all whereas the first town hall that kamala harris had which i mentioned uh and i talked about before on our last episode last podcast um she talked about in her first town hall after she declared she was going to run in january six months ago just a long time ago. It's amazing. It's been already been six months that she's been running, but um, she said that, yeah, she supports Medicare for all period. Her campaign said the same exact thing, but then they backtracked even in that town hall, that CNN town hall six months ago, she said she supported abolishing, um, uh, abolishing pri you know, private health insurance companies and health insurers. Um, then she backed up on that too. In the last debate, she uh, when they asked her, "Do you support abolishing uh, uh, private insurance?" Uh, private insurers, she said yes. She raised her hands, but then later on, in an interview on MSNBC's Morning Joe, she said that she uh, misinterpreted the question, and then she said she does not support uh, abolishing private insurers. So, Kamala Harris is definitely the most flip floppy one ever. Um, Elizabeth Warren has been a little bit smarter in just saying that she does not. <laughs> she does not support. Uh, Medicare for all um, to its fullest extent. She said she supports it, but she again she supports different paths to it. Whereas Kamala Harris has said she supports different paths, but that's after she said she supports it. 
you know, fully implementing support it, but then says something different later on. And um, yeah, so it's, it's you know, these, these are situations when it comes to the policies that are progressive policies that, you know, people like myself and other progressives support, you can be almost positively sure that majority of the candidates that are running in this race that claim to be in support of something like Medicare for All are not going to be supporting it. The only person that truly does support it and truly has stood behind it and not, excuse me, not swayed on that is Bernie Sanders. And that's why, as I've said many times, even said today, that anytime you see these candidates pushing for, supposedly pushing for Medicare for All and saying they support it, and just, or, let alone any progressive policies, really, they're not really, they don't really support them. You, you can't trust these people to ultimately, to, you know, ultimately back up what they're going to, you know, back up what they said before and just kind of repeat it and just say like, okay, this is what I believe. And they, they just won't do it. So, yeah. So, but when it comes to, when it comes to these, these progressive candidates, um, a lot of them, I just, uh, I have trouble supporting them um, because I don't feel like their policies are consistently progressive. And as I've said before, um, Bernie Sanders is the only, is the only candidate uh, up there that I truly do support all of his policies and I support um, everything that he says and I trust him. Tulsi Gabbard obviously is somebody that I've mentioned that I would support as well. Um, but I, I just don't think she has much of a, as much of a chance as Bernie does. Um, and she also kind of came out against Medicare for All, which was a little weird. She said that supposedly doesn't support like plastic surgery or something. Somebody was mentioning something about that, about why Tulsi Gabbard did not raise her hand when asked, do you support Medicare for All? But I, but I think she does, she does support it to, to, you know, to some extent. I don't know if it's... I don't know if she supported like the legislation that was in Congress because she's in the House of Representatives. I don't think she support. I'm not sure if she supported that bill or not when it was proposed in in the House, um, especially when John Conyers, who was uh, who's now a former me member of Congress, he's retired now. Um, he he was pushing for essentially Medicare for all in the House caucus for many years. He kept proposing it and proposing and proposing it. And, but I don't know if uh, Tulsi Gabbard ever proposed, I'm sorry, ever supported that, um, that legislation. So I'll have to check on that. But, but yeah, I mean, Bernie Sanders is the only candidate for, for me. I, at the moment, I have no other candidate that I would support other than Bernie Sanders. For, so, and, and if I were to, you know, if I were to vote in the general election, I would probably end up voting third party because I support the third party more than anybody um, outside of Bernie Sanders. So that's just, yeah, that's, that's where, that's, that's where my, that's where my position is as far as candidates and, you know, parties, you know even in the general election. So um, we'll, we'll see what happens. Obviously, Bernie is somebody that I hope gets in because he's our big, best and biggest hope, for sure. Um, so let's, let's do the next segment here. This one is going to also be about Joe Biden. Um, Joe Biden is... Uh, so he did a obviously as I told you in the last second I was talking about him how he did a um, he did an interview with CNN and he was you know he went after Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and you know Medicare for all and, and you know Bernie Sanders' legislation stuff and talking about how their ideas are not very good so in this so in this segment or at least this part of the conversation that I'm going to be detailing and that I'm going to be kind of getting into more, you know, I'm going to be talking about more in, in an article that's uh, from CNBC.com, but in the, um, in this part of the segment, um, or in this part of the interview with uh, Chris Cuomo, he talks about supporting the individual mandate that was, or, you know, that existed under Obamacare and how he would re-implement it. So let's see what he says here and then we'll talk about it on the other side you versus the rest of the field on the economy they're all going big 70 percent tax rates free college re-architecture of the economy a forgiving debt 
for college, which happens to be the biggest asset on the American government's balance sheet. You do not believe in those things. I don't believe in the way they're doing that. For example, I think every, there should be health care for everyone. I have a plan how to do that that's rational and will cost a hell of a lot less and will work. In terms of... Too incremental? The, no, it's not incremental. It's Would bold. you bring back the individual mandate? Pardon me? Would you bring back the individual yes. mandate? Yes, I bring back the individual you mandate. Think that'll be popular? Well, it's not. Yes, now it would be compared to what's being offered. And here's the deal, Chris. We're in a situation where if you provide an option for anybody who, in fact, wants to buy into Medicare for all, they can buy in. They buy in. And they can do it. But if they like their employer-based insurance, which a lot of unions broke their neck to get, a lot of people like their, they shouldn't have to give it up. The flip of that is, if you don't go my way you ha and you go their way, you have to give up all that. And what's going to happen when you have 300 million people landing on a health care plan? How long is that going to take? What's it going to do? And in the meantime, a lot of people are going to be in trouble. In terms of the economy, Chris, I've been proposing for a long time. And, and I've, look... I know I'm middle class, Joe. I get that part. It's not meant I'm sophisticated. It meant I'm, you know, the middle class built this country. You didn't have Wall Street build this country. And how'd they do it? You gave people a chance. You allowed them to maintain their dignity. And how'd they do it? How can you have dignity without having health care? How can you have dignity without having access to an education? How can you have dignity unless you can live in a neighborhood that's not fouled by the environment? I mean, he just says all the things that, that people want to hear. And, well, to some extent or another, at least in that last part of the interview. But, you know, when he talks about how he's in favor of bringing back the individual mandate, he says, well, you know, it'll be a hell of a lot more popular than we have right now or what's being offered right now. Now, I don't know if he's talking about what, you know, essentially Trump care is or, well, there is no Trump care, really. But I mean, as far as what Trump has taken away from Obamacare and, you know, kind of stripped it down to and, um, you know whatever is left essentially of Obamacare. Yeah, okay, it's better than that. It's not better than Medicare for all. He says as well, it's more pr pragmatic than Medicare for all. And, you know, but that's ridiculous. And Obama, I mean, Obamacare, especially in the individual mandate, first of all, the individual mandate is a Republican idea. When uh, Mitt Romney first, you know, w when he, when he uh, signed it into law in, when he was governor of Massachusetts, that was the law there. In Massachusetts, now Massachusetts is largely a pretty blue state, but he was the governor there and he was not like super right wing, Romney, I mean, and he, you know, made it happen there. But that doesn't mean that the individual mandate is, uh, you know, supposedly is, um, you know, really popular among Democrats because what? Because it was in Obamacare, but how popular is Obamacare? So Obamacare itself is not even that popular, especially among progressives. So what Biden is basically saying is he's going to bring back Obamacare. He's going to be doing the same exact thing as Obamacare. And he talks about how, oh, I believe in health care for all and everything. That's bullshit. He does not believe in health care for all. He believes in Obamacare. He believes in, well, he says he believes in the public option, but I don't even know if he believes that because Obama said he believed that. And then he ended up getting Obamacare and Obamacare was essentially Romney care. And re remember the, the, you know, what, what the, so like the, the, the kind of the overall, the overall like plan of what Obamacare was initially, so the, the kind of the, the initial write up of what Obamacare was, was initially, um, uh, it was initially um, written and kind of laid out by the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative organization. Even uh, Richard Nixon, when he was president, had implemented some version of what Obamacare is now with a whole individual mandate and all that stuff, and essentially what became Romneycare. But so Richard Nixon did it, and then the Heritage Foundation, you know, kind of put it together. And then even a lot of the Republicans that were, that were, um, so when they were in power under Bill Clinton, or even before they were in power, um, when they were going when they were going up against Hillary Clinton's idea of universal health care, who was you know Hillary Clinton was pushing for universal health care at the time when she was first lady. She was very politically involved back then in the early to mid '90s, especially on on issues like health care as well as like you know, the crime bill and everything, but that's another situation. But as far as when it came to healthcare, she was in favor, you know, she was pushing for essentially like Hillary care. And her idea of Hillary care, care as far as I know, was essentially use universal health care. And so she was actually pretty decent back then compared to when she ran in 2016, when she was basically just like pushing for 
basically Obamacare and maybe some, I don't know, maybe the public option. But she was totally against what Bernie was pushing for, obviously, just as, you know, just as Biden and, and you know, majority of the candidates are against Bernie's idea, too, um, as much as they claim they are in favor of it. But, um, but yeah, but uh, so the Republicans' idea of what they were pushing against Hillary Clinton back when she was um, first lady and pushing for Hillary Care, they were pushing for what Obamacare is now. Or what Obamacare ended up being as far as the individual mandate and, you know, so their opposition to Hillary Care was Obamacare, ironically. So Obamacare before it was Obamacare. I mean, that's, I mean, is, if that's not embarrassing, I don't know what is because that's, that's uh, so absurd and so ridiculous. But unfortunately, a lot of people, if you ask them or if you tell them something like this, you know, they're going to be like, what? No way. That's, there's no way that Obamacare was, a, you know, Republican idea, even though. I mean, maybe a lot of people do know that maybe it was a Romney idea, but like, I think to a lot of Democrats out there, like, oh, well, you know, you know, Mitt Romney isn't as bad as maybe other Republicans. He's not as bad as Trump and he's not, he wasn't as bad as George Bush. So, you know, but Obamacare is a better version of that. That's probably what they'll say, which is honestly bullshit. And that's not true at all, but it's just, you know, because it has Obama's name on it, they act like it's perfectly fine and it's okay. When in reality, it's not. Um, so, yeah. So, Biden basically believes in bringing back Obamacare. He believes in uh, having the individual mandate because he wants to have... He wa he still wants to have the, the insurance companies involved because, ultimately, that's what he cares about. He cares about the insurance companies having... You know, getting their cut of the cut of the loot, essentially. So, um, I'm going to cover the... Uh, or, I'm going to uh, kind of read the CNBC article here, which gets into more detail about... Um, Biden's views and then kind of uh, a little, you know, some more facts and details about um, about this subject here. So the title of the article is Biden uh, vows to bring back Obamacare's individual mandate penalty for not having insurance. So the, uh, this is an article from CNBC.com. A uh, couple of the key points here pointed out is quoting Biden where he says, yes, I'd bring back the individual mandate says the 2020 Democratic presidential hopeful, arguing it would be popular now compared to what's being offered. Uh, the Trump administration eliminated the, the individual mandate in 2017, effective in the 2019 tax year. The former vice president also says he supports providing emergency health care for undocumented immigrants. Says uh, Joe Biden, former vice president and 2020 Democratic presidential hopeful, said Friday he would bring back the individual mandate, the penalty for not having health insurance, which was a pillar of the Affordable Care Act. Yes, I'd bring back the individual mandate, Biden said in an interview, interview on CNN. The individual mandate would be popular now compared to what's being offered, he added. Biden played an integral, integral part in crafting the ACA, which is the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare. Um, commonly known as Obamacare. However, President Donald Trump eliminated the individual mandate in 2017 by signing the Republican tax bill effective the 2019, ta uh, the 2019 tax year. Nearly all of the Democratic presidential hopefuls support some kind of government health care plan. While he does not support, uh, he's not... He does not support Medicare for all. Biden said people should have the option to buy into Medicare if they want it. Quote, if you provide an option for anybody who in fact wants to buy into Medicare for all, they can buy in, the Democratic presidential frontrunner said. Biden also took a nuanced approach Friday, saying he supports providing emergency, emergency health care for undocumented immigrants in the United States. Quoting Biden again, it says, I think undocumented people need to have a means by which they can be covered when they're sick. Biden said, in an emergency, they should have health care. At last week's Democratic presidential debate, all 10 of the hopefuls on stage, including Biden, Senators Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, and Kirsten Gillibrand, raised their hands in support of care for people in the country illegally. So immigrants, illegal immigrants. Uh, Biden on CNN was threading the needle on the issue, talking about taking care of the health needs of undocumented immigrants in emergencies, um, quoting, how do you say you're undocumented? You're going to die, man. Um, providing uh, wide access to health care would prove to be contentious, with many polls saying Americans do not support coverage for undocumented immigrants. The 2010 Affordable Care Act, which passed when Biden was former president 
uh, Barack Obama's vice president, largely excluded the undocumented uh, from buying into uh, U.S. into U.S. healthcare programs. After the debate, President Donald Trump tweeted against the move. All Democrats just raised their hand for giving millions of illegal aliens unlimited health care. How about taking care of American citizens first? That's the end of that race. Okay. However, Trump's rhetoric was not surprising to Biden. Quoting Biden again, it says, this is part of what Trump is playing on. He said, playing on people's fears of having open borders and people flowing into the U.S. Biden said, providing health care to people who are sick is just common decency. So Biden is, you know, he's not, he, he's just latching on to, to, in my opinion, he's latching on to like the little amount of, of, life that he has left i mean granted he is the front runner i'm not saying that he's like completely downfall you know he's in a complete downfall but when it comes to the trajectory of his campaign he's definitely going downwards he's not going up i mean he doesn't have he's not running on anything that appeals to anybody now obviously he has the appeal he has the not the appeal, but he has the support of the establishment. He is liked by a lot of the establishment. He is liked by a lot of people out there who are, um, you know, who are part, you know, they're, they're kind of lovers of the Democratic Party. And he, you know, he, he's happy to have their support. And that's, but that's the problem. He, that's all he really cares. Ultimately, that's all he cares about. And that's a huge mistake. And he's making the same exact mistake that Hillary Clinton made. Um, Kyle from Secular Talk tweeted about it this uh, this afternoon, I believe, or this morning. He was, you know, mentioning how, you know, he is making the same mistakes as Hillary, and he's just kind of relying on, you know, get, you know, having that Democratic Party support, and oh well, whatever. The progressives are just going to come along because they're going to fall in line because they have to. But that's not going to happen. Anybody that assumes that the, that the progressives and the more you know left wing part of the Democratic Party base, let alone just left-wing voters in general, whether they're in the Democratic Party or not. Um, they're, they're the fact that they're just going to follow along because they hate Trump and they don't want Trump, that's not true at all. And it doesn't matter how much uh, um, Bernie Sanders campaigns for Biden, assuming, by, obviously, this is assuming Biden is the nominee. But no matter how much, you know, bra uh, you know Bernie Sanders uh, campaigns for Biden and says that Trump should not be president and, you know, we need to get Trump out of there, that doesn't mean that Joe, that Joe Biden is going to win. does not mean that we're going to vote for him i'm not going to vote for joe biden i mean that's just the the, the that's just the case that's the that's that's how it's going to be because i i can't in in good conscience i cannot do that i can't go vote for somebody that i do not support yes i hate trump yes i despise trump i do not want him to become president i'm sorry to, to remain president any longer than he already is let, let alone now um you know, the conversation of impeachment and everything is a different story because I also don't want Mike Pence to become president because he's obviously vice president. I don't want Mike, Pe Mike Pence to become, you know, to get into that role because I think he's worse than Trump. But that's a different conversation. The point is, is that I will not fall in line just because the Democrats and the Democratic nominee demands that I do. And Joe Biden is, is not the person that's going to, first of all, he's not going to beat Trump, period. Just on his rhetoric alone, if you're going to be running as like the next Obama, the white old Obama, you're not going to win. At least with Bernie Sanders, okay, he's older. He's obviously old. He's older than Biden is. But at least he's running on, on you know policies that, that the progressives support and majority of the country supports. So at least he's doing something different. Joe Biden is just running on I'm uh, uh, old white uh, Obama, basically. And he's running on the coattails of his of his you know boss essentially his former boss in this case, and that's all he's doing. He's just grifting off of Obama, and he knows he's going to get the support of the black politicians. We talked about um, this in a prior pod, you know, I think it was the last podcast I mentioned it, but it was a prior podcast where I talked about how um, I got into detail about um, how the black politicians, black Democratic politicians, were talking about how they wanted Kamala Harris to be uh, Joe Biden's uh, VP nominee before we even had a debate yet. Before, like, I think it was like a month. It was, I think it was like a month or month and a half ago or something. And 
Kamala Harris, supposedly they wanted her to be Obama's VP because he's so loved among the black community. Because he was Obama's VP, the black politicians love him, so they assume that the black people, the black population, the black constituency, the black community loves him. So I don't know if that's the case. I haven't seen the polls for Biden among the black community. I think it's decent, as far as I know. Um, but, you know, you can't just assume that they're going to vote for you, especially when you've supported the crime bill. You don't even support legalizing marijuana. And you talked about super, not, he didn't talk about super, he talked about just predators in general. He didn't use the necessarily the Hillary Clinton term when she was first lady. But, um, he, you know, he used the, the predators term and fear monger about how, you know, not necessarily black people, but criminals are going to, you know, rape your wife and then beat your, beat down your son and your daughter or whatever, you know, kick your ass or something some bullshit like that and he was just fear-mongering out of his fucking ass when he was in the senate before in the when he was arguing in favor of the crime bill and you know but when it comes to health care he is trying to grift again and in this case he's trying to grift off of the guy that you know was pretty much just as centrist as him but just a black man and you know a better speaker essentially and that's it and Biden honestly doesn't have anything appealing about him at all. He he has as much appeal as you know a you know a fucking ham sandwich, in my opinion. I mean, he doesn't do anything for anybody on the left wing of the party, and he just wants to suck up to the uh, suck up to his corporate donors. And he is does not care anything about the middle class. He does not care anything about um, changing anything for people that are suffering. He's going to continue to do the same exact things that the Democratic Party is doing, which is continues to be an utter failure and he you know th that means that he is not going to beat trump because he doesn't even though he's quote unquote better than trump that doesn't mean he's enough he's good enough that he's going to beat trump let alone good enough for p you know to convince people that that they should you know vote for him because i definitely know i'm not and i know a lot of progressives out there are not going to do that either So we have a um, article here from um, MorningConsult.com. Morning Consult is a is a polling company, and they, you know, they just they they kind of ask questions, I guess, and then you know put the polls out there and just inform people on those kind of things um, regarding you know where the where the country um, is on different various issues. In uh, in this case, they are. Um, talking about how Medicare for All, um, majority of the people in this country back Medicare for All, replacing private plans as long as the uh, preferred provider stay. So um, let's check this article out and then we'll um, basically discuss it as we go along. So it says majority backs Medicare for All, replacing private plans if preferred provider stay. That's the title. The subtitle says, Reduced Support for Single Payer Overcome by Assurance that Americans Would Not Lose Their Doctor and Hospital. And it's got a couple bullet points here. It says, 55% of voters back a Medicare for All system that diminishes the role of private insurance insurers if they retain access to their preferred providers. Independents are 14 points more likely to back the system when told losing their private plan would not mean losing their doctor. Their doctor, 42% to 56%. Um, so here's the article here. It says, though... Though the dividing line between Democratic presidential candidates on Medicare for All concerns the elimination of the private insurance market, new morning consult data suggests that anxiety among voters may, may be dis misplaced fear about losing their, their providers rather than their private plans. According to a morning consult political, political survey conducted after the first Democratic presidential debates, support among voters for Medicare for All falls to 46% from 53% when respondents are told the government-run system would diminish the role of private insurers. 
but rises back to 55% when voters learn that losing their private plans would still allow them to keep their preferred doctors and hospitals. Between the forums last Wednesday and Thursday, only four of the 20 candidates on stage said they were in favor of abolishing uh, private health insurance in favor of a government-run plan. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio and Senators uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Kamala Harris uh, later partially mod. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, and Kamala Harris. Uh, so those are the four: Bill De Blasio, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris. Then it says Harris later partially modified her position, stating she misheard the question and believes private plans should continue offering supplemental coverage alongside the federal system, as would be the case under Sanders's Medicare for All plan. Uh, let's see, quoting, who is this quoting? It's quoting Bernie Sanders um, uh, responding. I guess he sent an email to Morning Consult, which is the polling company. He says, these numbers only affirm what the senator has, many, has said many times. People don't like insurance companies. They like their doctors and their hospitals. Sanders' campaign said of data of the data in the email to Born Consult. Despite what the pharmaceutical and insurance industries tell you, Medicare for All is the only proposal that gives Americans the freedom to control their own futures, change jobs, start a family, start a business, and keep their doctor. Several polls have demonstrated that support for Medicare for All plummets when Americans learn the system would replace employer sponsored coverage with one sweeping plan, forcing single-payer supporters to go on the defensive to alleviate concerns from voters. But as candidates attempt to persuade voters that Medicare for All would not require diminishing the role of private insurers, further adding to confusion, uh, confusion among the electorate about what exactly the system would entail, the new data suggests that the, the consequences of that argument can be mitigated by cl clarifying that losing private insurance insurers would not affect access to preferred providers. The June 29th to July survey of, of 1,472 found voters found that an explanation to be especially effective in quelling skepticism, skepticism among Democrats and independents. Among independents, 56% back a Medicare for all system that nixes the private, in, the private market but allows people to keep their doctors, a 14% increase over the share that only hears about the diminished role of private insurance insurers. The poll had a margin error of 3% of 3 percentage points. Republicans who have not yet forgotten about uh, who have not yet forgotten former president Barack Obama's promise with respect to the Affordable Care Act that if you like your health care plan you can keep it were mostly unmoved by the by the addendum. Private insurance companies have much to lose from the implement implementation of Medicare for All, leading opposition efforts on Capitol Hill and across the country alongside Republicans who have decried single-payer as a socialist takeover of health care. Few candidates have been frank in admitting the Medicare for All bills in the House and Senate would phase out private insurance insurers over a transition period of two or four years, respectively. Other presidential hopefuls, such as Kirsten Gillibrand and former Texas Representative Beto O'Rourke, have offered broad statements in support of universal health care while insisting they would not lessen the role of insurers in the health care system. Previous morning consult polling has also indicated um, Americans who are against Medicare for all on the grounds that it would reduce the role of insurance companies may be inadvertently conflating their payers and providers. Among adults who said they opposed the system, 62% said they are more likely to support the plan if they could keep their doctors and hospitals. So, you know, as, I, as I've said before with any kind of poll, you can't always take it with a grain of salt, but this is very positive. This is very positive news for Bernie Sanders. It is very positive news for the progressive movement. Um, people, you know, people, I think no matter what, they're always going to be scared of the labels. So whenever Republicans come out there and say, this is a socialist takeover, like people are going to freak out about that no matter what you do. And then again, Republicans are going to call any kind of health care that gives any kind of um, decent or even, you know, I would say remotely shitty quality of health care. They're going to call it socialist, a socialist takeover, and they're going to call it 
socialism to some, to one extent or another. So, you know, when John Hickenlooper or whatever says that, oh, well, you know, we can't give the Republicans ammunition to call a socialist by pushing for so, so-called socialist policies. So that doesn't mean shit because the Republicans are going to call whatever the Democrats do socialism no matter what. There was an article I read, I think I covered it on this podcast, about how Mike Pence thinks. Mike Pence, who's the VP of um, Donald Trump, thinks that Joe Biden is a socialist and believes in socialist policies and wants to push for socialism. There was an there was a um, interview that um, Emma uh, Vig- Emma Vigeland from um, from TYT um, investigates or TYT interviews or something. Um, she works for TYT Rebel headquarters or whatever it is. Um, she does interviews. She kind of goes around and does interviews with um, Trump supporters and just kind of random people in general. And um, she did an interview with a Trump supporter, a female, a woman, a kind of an older boomer woman. And she was wearing a you know red MAGA hat and everything. And she talked about how Joe Biden is a socialist and he believes in socialist policies, and he wants to do a socialist takeover, all that shit. And she um, also said that um, the problem with socialism is that it's all about greed, and it's all about um, money, and it's all about taking your, I don't know, money away from you, when in reality, that's what capitalism is. So, yeah, the woman was just completely uneducated, and she was like a typical Trump supporter, and, you know didn't make any goddamn sense i think she might have been from latin america she might have been from a central latin america south america american uh, country because you know kind of the countries that have had like socialism and communism you know in their you know in their governments essentially when they were living there so she you know could have been she could have been from cuba that's a possibility as well but you know she was obviously seemed from seemed to be from one of those countries because the all you know based on her accent and based on her kind of the dialect of how she was speaking you could tell she was not born in america um but on top of that i assume you know based on what she was saying as well because i've seen it from other people just on just based on what she was saying as far as like not only her dialect and the you know her accent and everything but also that the things that she was saying it definitely struck me as somebody that was probably from south america and um but yeah it's you know these people they're always going to be talking about how the policies of the you know the democrats and the policies of bernie sanders are going to be socialist and you know it's going to take over take over everything but in reality it's the system of the capitalists the capitalists and the corporatists the you know you know as i have a book here of the um uh, you know from dylan radigan who's a progressive um he's a former msnbc host but he's a great progressive he wrote a book about corporate communists and how corporate communists are extracting the american you know the wealth of the american people and putting it into all the you know the, the you know you at least using like tax cuts essentially and extracting it and then uh implement you know kind of you know putting it into the you know the the government well not the government but they're they're kind of funneling it through the governmental system and you know obviously the corporate donors have a role in that it's just kind of going kind of going around in like a in like kind of a circle of just like you know transferring it over and, and and you know extracting it over from you know from donor to donor and you know corporate ceo and all these people all these people that give money to all these candidates and stuff and it's just being but it's being extracted from the middle class through you know forms of tax cuts and you know you know giveaways to the big you know to the you know super rich and the big corporations who then implement it into the into the government well, in this case, not the government, but into the into the politicians who work for the government, so that those politicians can do for can can do uh, the policies in the government that the pol- that, that that the you know super rich donors and you know corporate donors and fundraisers want. So they're just obviously doing the bidding of those big corporate corporate you know corporate donors and big corporations and you know all the people that you know basically work for those companies and. Um, that's general. That's the general idea of what um, uh, the the corporate communism that Dylan Radigan is talking about, and that's honestly the general idea that Bernie Sanders is talking about as well. And that's something that needs to be realized because capitalism is ultimately a system that is made to ensure the endless profit of the super rich and the endless profit of 
um, the corporations that continue to screw over regular people. So c capitalism does not mean prosperity for regular people. It means prosperity for the, the, the people that have the most money. And if you don't have anything, you're not going to make it in, in, in capitalism, in a capitalist system. Now, you, people can talk about how, oh, well, if you go and, I don't know, start a, you start a small business and, you know, you work hard and you make things happen, capitalism will ultimately work for you. Okay, so, I mean, if you want to talk about, like, highly regulated capitalism, so you want to talk about, like, a social democracy, which is largely what Bernie Sanders supports, you can have, you can, you know, I can, at least speaking for myself, I can concede that, okay, that can work to some extent, as it has in countries like, you know, in countries like Scandinavia and you know, in France and in different parts of Europe, you know, Canada, you know, UK and stuff, they don't have like a fully socialized, you know, obviously communist type system. They have more of a social democracy, democratic socialist uh, type mentality when it comes to how they run their economy and how they run their country in general. So, you know, you can make the case that those systems work, but ultimately, even with those systems, you're going to end up with a lot of people in those countries becoming billionaires, which honestly shouldn't exist. We shouldn't have billionaires in this country, and we shouldn't have people that have so much money that they can throw it around to to um, influence our system, which basically what is, I mean, not basically, it is what's happening with our country here because all those billionaires have enough money to put into our, to, to put into our political system and influence all the politicians that are running, whether it's for president, whether it's for Senate, whether it's Congress, whatever it is, governor, everything, you know, even in lower state houses, even in state, state houses, state legislatures, all that stuff, even those people are affected. And, you know, it's, you know, these are the people that are going to be against Medicare for all. They, they're going to hate Medicare for all. They're going to hate the fact that the insurance companies aren't going to have some sort of role in something. And, you know, they're going to have a fight. To, they're going to have a big fight, you know, and we're going to have a big fight, but they're going to be fighting us. And we're going to fight against them as hard as possible. And, you know, if they don't like the way, um, you know, the people in Europe and all these other countries that have a good healthcare system live, then, you know, I mean, you're basically fighting against the inevitable and you're and you're definitely fighting against um the facts you're fighting against the fact that you know the fact that the the systems that are best for the people for regular people are those systems that involve that that, that involve you know Help, you know, insuring people as much as possible, but not using an insurance, not using an insurance company who want to kick you off their plans as fast as possible, as possible and, and as much as possible, because they know those plans, because those insurance companies know that that if the you know the person that wants the surgery, you know, let's say if they want to get cancer treatment or they want to get some sort of surgery that they need very badly, you know, whatever it is, but you know, they know that the higher the cost of those things that, that need to be spent for that person, the, you know, the more that insurance company has to spend and they don't want to do it. And a lot of times they're going to kick you off their plans and, you know, they're going to try and get any way out. They're going to try and find, they're going to try and find any way out as possible. And if it leads to your death and leads to your demise, then that's just the way it is. And that's why 45,000 people a year die every year from lack of health insurance. And I mean, it's, uh, Honestly, if you're if you're okay with that, you're just a monster, and you're you don't have any morals, you don't have any ethics, and all these Republicans that claim to be pro-life, they're not pro-life. If they're letting all these, you know, if they're letting forty-five thousand people die every year from lack of health care, that's every year. That's crazy. I mean, that's more than the amount of people that die from gun deaths. So, and that's already bad enough. You know, so if you're allowing that to happen, you're not a moral person. So don't talk about being pro-life. Don't talk about how you care about your, your fellow man, because you clearly don't. So Kamala Harris, um, she um, had a pretty big moment during the debate and um the debates which happened uh, it was the second debate second night of debate uh with uh, joe biden and bernie sanders was there kirsten Gillibrand, a bunch of other people so kamala harris um she went after joe biden for um being anti-busing so he um so he was against busing 
so against segregated busing in uh, you know in the south when he uh, so when he was senator in the 70 say yeah so he started when he was in the i think it was 1973 i think joe biden started and um he, he started in the senate he's he was in the senate until 2009 and he was against segregation, seg uh, busing in, in the segregated South, and um, Kamala Harris called him out for that. And she did a very good job of calling him out for that. I, myself, I consider, I considered her to be one of the big winners because she did that. Um, uh, all the polls show, definitely show that as well. However, Kamala Harris has flip flopped once again on this issue well not once again on this issue but she's what she's flipped up on an flip flop on another issue on but on this one um it's very surprising considering how passionately she was um arguing in favor um you know obviously well arguing against joe biden but you know obviously talking about how you know he should have been in favor of busing and he claimed that he you know he he wasn't against it and that he was only against it because of you know going through the department of education i don't know but, but biden was constantly deflecting throughout that debate so he did a horrible job and harris definitely got on him but she has flip-flopped on this one a little bit and i wanted to give you the details on that um so this is an article uh, in the Chicago Tribune, it's actually through Associated Press, but it's uh, this one is I'm reading this one from the Chicago Tribune, and it's titled Senator Kamala Harris says busing should be considered, but not federally mandated. So, reading from the main article, that was the headline. Reading from the main article, it says Senator Kamala Harris said Wednesday that busing students should be considered by school districts trying to desegregate their locations, not the federal mandate she appeared to support in poignantly criticizing rival Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden last week. Harris had a breakthrough moment at the candidates' first debate when she criticized Biden for his opposition to mandatory busing uh, when he was a senior, uh, I'm sorry, when he was a senator in the 1970s. Harris said she benefited from busing as an elementary school student in Berkeley, California in the early 1970s. That's where the federal government must step in, Harris said, looking at Biden and winning a burst of applause from the auditorium in Miami. On Wednesday, though, Harris characterized busing as a choice local schools, local school districts have, not the responsibility of the federal government. Busing, while not central to the Democratic primary, has become a proxy issue for the debate between Biden and Harris over race as well as broader questions about the 76-year-old former vice president uh, um, is out of step with his party. <clears throat> After a Democratic Party picnic Wednesday in uh, West Des Moines, um, I guess that's Iowa, yes, yeah, um, Harris was asked by reporters whether she supports federally, manda federally mandated busing. Quoting her, it says, I think of busing as being in the toolbox of what is available and what can be used for the goal of desegregating America's schools, she responded. Asked to clarify whether she supports federally mandated busing, she replied, I believe that any tool that is in the toolbox should be considered by a school district. In a tweet Wednesday, Biden deputy campaign manager Kate Bedingfield knocked Harris for her response, writing, It's disappointing that Senator Harris chose to distort Vice President Biden's position on busing, particularly now that she is tying herself in knots trying not to answer the very question she posed to him. Harris's comments... Uh, Harris's comments uh, Wednesday were far from the indictment she delivered during the debate last week. Under attack on the debate stage, Biden appeared stunned and dismissed Harris's comments as a, mis as a mischaracterization of his positions. He has notably begun his remarks to fundraisers by talking about how civil rights spurred his entry into public life more than 45 years ago. To be sure, Biden's record on busing is complicated. Biden has, ins uh, has insisted he only opposed busing ordered by the Federal Education Department. So the, what is that? The, yeah, Department of Education. And said allowing local governments and school districts to implement busing was, quote, one of the things I argued for at the time. During an appearance at, the co at a conference last week in Chicago, Biden told the audience he never, 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 ever 
opposed voluntary busing. But Biden was an outspoken opponent of federally mandated busing in the 1970s and 80s, sponsoring a, con sponsoring a congressional measure that would have limited funding for federal busing efforts. The issue spelled into Iowa as Harris and Biden returned Wednesday for the first time since the debate. Both will need some uh, success in Iowa's leadoff nominating caucuses to build momentum heading into South Carolina, the first Southern primary, where they are vying, uh, vying aggressively for a robust African-American voting bloc. Biden and Harris also have been aggressively courting members of the Congressional Black Caucus, with Harris edging Biden in endorsements, picking up support from Representatives Bobby Rush of Illinois and Frederica H Wilson of Florida. Biden last week landed the support of popular Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. In, po uh, in Iowa, where African Americans are a small, small minority, endorsements from black leaders are magnified. Harris got the backing of two popular black, mi black ministers after her debate performance last week. Appearing Wednesday in Waterloo, Iowa's most densely African American city, Biden received the backing of one, one of the city's most influ influential black ministers. Yeah, so the, the debate of, you know, of busing and you know, federally mandated, you know, whether, you know, whether it's not, whether it's federally mandated or it's, uh, you know, should be considered by the schools. I think, listen, I, I don't obviously agree with the Biden campaign or, you know, well, Biden's campaign, just Biden in general, because they're obviously centrist establishment assholes. But the, the spokesperson the spokesperson for Joe, Joe Biden was correct, and let me read her quote again. It says, It's disappointing that Senator Harris chose to distort Vice President Biden's position on busing. I don't know. I don't think that's what happened, but that's what she's saying. I'm just reading it. But this next part is important. It says, Particularly now that she is tying herself in knots trying not to answer the very question she posed to him. So that's true. That's second. So the first part is not true because she didn't. I don't think that she mischaracterized, mischaracterized his position. I think Biden responded by flailing and kind to trying to um, uh, deflect and trying to actually re revert, you know, kind of re not reverse, but kind of kind of restate his position and make it seem as if it's like this when it's not the way he thinks that uh, Harris put it. But th that second part is definitely true. She is tying herself in knots and trying not to answer the very question that she posed to him. Now, she, you would think, she would think she would support federally mandated busing. And for some reason, now she's coming out against it, even though she said she was in favor of it and attacked Biden for being against it. So what's the deal? You, you I don't, I don't understand you. Did you talk to one of your strategists or did you talk to the Democrats the Democrats in you know in your party and the people that endorsed you. I mean, who? Some obviously somebody changed your opinion, or you just decided to change your own opinion because you're talking to people in Iowa. That's also another factor that 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 should be considered because, as it was stated in this article, a lot of people, majority of people in Iowa are not black, and compared to somewhere, you know, compared to other well other states i think mississippi is the most heavily black uh, heavily populated um black st uh, state with you know african americans black people i believe it's mississippi um as they said before south carolina is also very heavily uh, is also a big uh, state for getting black uh, black voters i think they may by maybe somewhere in the top five in most heavily uh, populated black states um so yeah mississippi south carolina um maybe alabama i don't yeah probably not alabama i don't know because obviously alabama has a lot of you know they have a lot of you know kind of right wing <laughs> probably a lot of kkk white segregation is there too i wouldn't be surprised obviously um but yeah maybe alabama too but you know different states in the south obviously the south is going to be very popular for you know obviously black voters that was somewhere that bernie sanders didn't do too well so we'll see what happens with that but as far as you know, these positions that, that Harris is taking and the position that Biden took. I mean, they're opportunistic. They're, opportun as usual, opportunistic positions that these opportun opportunistic politicians are taking because they know it's not smart for them to be, um, to be 
advocating too much in favor of uh, positions that, you know, white voters wouldn't support. And they're like, you know, they're, they're taking these positions to appease those white voters so that those people don't call them like, oh, you're too pro-black and you don't care about white people and you're anti-white or some shit bullshit like that. So especially when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, you know, a woman of color such as Kamala Harris, who's she's half Indian, uh, half Jamaican, um, which is considered black. And but she is a woman of color, but she doesn't want to pander that much to the black community. But ultimately, she probably will end up getting a lot of their votes because she's one of the only people in this race that's who's black, other than Cory Booger. As far as the uh, as far as the major candidates, she is one. She is pretty much the only other black candidate running. I think there's maybe one other person, but there I don't think they were even in the debate. They didn't qualify for the qualify for the debate. Um, so I don't know who they are. But yeah, so I mean, <laughs> this is how politicians are. You can't trust them to take any kind of any kind of consistent position on these on these kind of. Paul, on, on these kind of debates, you know, one second they're going to be deb debating in favor of it, next second they're going to go to another audience, and they're going to be saying something completely different. I've talked about this before, but unfortunately this is the way it is. They always change their positions based on which crowd they're talking to, because they know they can't piss off anybody too much, or else they're not going to be able to recover from that later on when they give a whole different position. <laughs> so, again, like I've said before about Joe Biden, I might have made, might have said it about other candidates too, but these are always candidates that always they always try and check, okay, which side should I go? Should I go on this side or should I go on that side? You know, which, you know, which, you know, which position should I take? You know, which one is most, uh, you know, most uh, feasible to not only my campaign, but is also tolerable among the, you know, people that are voting for me in that specific state, you know? And it's just, you can't trust these people. This is not something that Bernie Sanders does. Bernie Sanders maintains his his policy positions and his ideas as consistent, you know, as, as much as possible. And he's always consistent. And he does not stray away as far as what I know. Everything that I've seen from Bernie Sanders, even in 2016, he never strayed away from this. You know, he always maintained his principles. He always maintained his, his policies and he stuck to his principles because he knew that if he's going to sound one way one to one crowd or one debate or one town hall and he sounds completely different somewhere else, and he's going to end up looking like an idiot. And that's why he's hated by, maybe that's why he's hated by the establishment because the establishment people out there and the strategists out there, they want you to cater to specific audiences. And even with the existence of technology, cell phones, you know, smartphones, people, you know, taking pictures of you, do, pay, taking videos of you, you know, no matter what you do, even when you do those things. So even when those politicians get caught by, you know, it, you know, get caught in the crosshairs of technology, essentially, and they're caught saying something that, um, you know, they shouldn't be saying because they said something completely different before that, or just, just not, you know, or just saying something that they shouldn't be saying in general. But when they get caught doing that stuff, it doesn't really seem like they care even if they are caught. And... It's honestly amazing to me. I, I, or they just, I think it's one of two things. Either they think they just think like, okay, whatever, I don't care, and I'll just sound different one place, and I'll sound uh, another way a different place. To them, it doesn't matter, you know, in, in that regard. I don't think it matters. But I, and then the other thing I think is, I, I just think, honestly, I think that they, they assume that the American people are stupid. It has to be one of those two things. Either you just don't give a shit or you think people are stupid enough to just buy into whatever you're going to say and that you can convince them the next time you are in a debate or you're meeting people in a town hall or shaking hands and, you know, doing some sort of event where you're talking to people and they ask you, they, I think these politicians, honestly, the, the unprincipled politicians and the opportunistic ones, I think they feel like they can get away with these things because they can just say whatever and everybody's going to believe them. you know, they're just going to believe them and they're going to buy into whatever bullshit Shit they put out there because they're that crafty with their talking points and they i just don't think they just don't think they can get caught that i don't know I, it's it's hard to tell but that's what else could it really be honestly it's it's hard to it's kind of hard to tell because you don't see them obviously saying like oh yeah well no you know these people are idiots and i can just say whatever i want but you know it, it's it's not these politicians know what they're doing 
And it doesn't ultimately come down to being principled and it doesn't come down to being, um, you know, being truthful and being honest. It, it just comes down to pleasing whatever you, whatever specific base or constituency or crowd or whatever you're talking to or audience or state or city or town, whatever. It just depends who you're talking to. And, and that's why when they're talking to people in, in, you know, cable news and on TV and stuff. So like a, you know, some sort of, you know, pundit top show where they're brought on and asking questions, you know, answering questions, they, they always have to dance around those questions and they always have to dance around what, you know, how they articulate things and how they put things because they know that, you know, these journalists who a lot, honestly, a lot of them are obviously just giving them softball questions anyway, but they know they have to dance around those questions as much as possible or else they're going to get caught um, with the, with their hand in the cookie jar again. And they know they can't have that. They know they can't deal with that. So it's ultimately a position that, it's all everything with the these politicians is ultimately taking a position of least resistance and least uh, controversy. You know, least controversy, because if they go into that controversy, then they can't get out of it. And for them, it's going to be like getting out of quicksand, honestly. And they know this. And you know, even somebody like me knows this. But that doesn't mean I support them because I know that you know, as much as you know, they're going to be getting themselves in trouble by saying things that maybe aren't popular or maybe aren't things that people want to hear. Sometimes, you know, whether whether or not it's popular, regardless of that that whole you know that that whole dynamic. But you know, they're going to say things that are going to that are going to please the people that are going to that are going to criticize them the least, and. When it comes to the that's why they support. That's why they that's why they get the support of want to get the support of the donors so badly and the the corporate donors and the you know want to do fundraisers and suck up to the rich so much because they know that as long as they can say the things that those people want, then they could get their money. Whereas the regular people out there, the people that are donating to Ber somebody like Bernie Sanders who is principled, those people they don't care about them because those people are not giving them as much money as those corporate donors are, and they only love the corporate donors for their money. And that's all they care about because it's all about greed and it's all about uh, getting enough money in your campaign coffers so that you can uh, have enough money to spend on attack ads and spend on traveling to different states and then, you know, spouting more of your bullshit in this case with Biden and, you know, Kamala Harris and all those candidates spouting your bullshit that people are going to, you know, believe just like I said before, talking to a certain audience and just saying, you know, to them, whatever they want to hear, basically, and then going to another state and saying something completely different. And that's, that's what it comes down to. I have uh, one more article here um, regarding Kamal Harris. And this is an actually, this is actually an article from uh, February of this year. So February 25th, this was, again, this was after she ran, uh, I'm sorry, after she declared she was running, she uh, declared running um, on January 20, uh, 21st, which was MLK day. Uh, this article is from February 25th, uh, about a month after that, where um, she made some comments uh, regarding, regarding kind of her support for Israel and stuff like that. And, um, it's I, I don't remember it getting a lot of attention, but the reason why I want to actually bring this up now is because I was watching in a segment from Kyle Kyle Klinsky of Secular Talk, where um, you know uh, Kamala Harris was putting out her kind of typical shilling arguments, shilling in favor of the you know Israel and the you know Israel lobby in this case APAC, and. Um, she talked about how, you know, the reason that she supports Israel, it's, um, the, the reason that she puts Israel is because they're a democracy and we're a democracy and that they have our back and we have their back, blah, blah, blah. Just a bunch of the, the same typical bullshit. So just basically we support them because they support us and they're not as bad as all the other countries in the Middle East and that makes them wonderful and blah, blah, blah. So kind of typical, you know, Typical opportunistic bullshit that you're going to have to expect from the likes of um, Kamala Harris and honestly, majority of the politicians out there who are who are opportunistic and just want to make the establishment happy. So these con so those comments were bad. I mean, those comments were already bad. This is even worse. 
So this is like, this is ridiculous. The, the comments here are just, uh, they blew me away. I'm sure they're going to blow you away too. So let, let's get into it right now here. So this, so this article is from Mandawais. This is a publication. Um, it, it describes itself as a news website devoted to covering American foreign policy in the Middle East, chief, chiefly from a progressive Jewish perspective and also in kind of an anti-Zionist perspective as well and that because that's how the founder describes themselves as so um check out the the article here see so, so it says um kamala harris told apac she backs israel because of civil rights struggle in selma 1965 <laughs> so that title alone already is fucking horrible like that just sounds bad and it's gonna definitely get a lot worse as we get into the details here um so let's start from the top of the article here. It says, it says many people have an analogized, analogized, analog, analogized, um, Palestinian conditions to the Jim Crow South. Representative Rashida Tlaib did so. So has Jimmy Carter, who grew up in the segregated Georgia, or segregated South in Georgia. Alabama native uh, Condoleezza Rice also did so. Wow, that's surprising. Um, and just last week, uh, Angela Davis said in Birmingham that Palestinians were an, were an inspiration to black people in the civil rights struggle. So it's a little odd to hear Senator Kamala Harris using the segregated South as a basis for her love for Israel. That's what she did in a private discussion with the Israel lobby group APAC last year saying that the famous civil rights march in 1965 across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, was a guide to her to build a bridge with Israel supporters. Quote, building the coalition and building the connection between all of us to fight together. And that's on the issue of Israel. It's on the issue of so many challenges that we face as a world. Here's the context. At a town hall in Bettendorf, Iowa, yesterday, an audience member called on the presidential hopeful to release her private comments last year to APAC, the leading Israel lobby group. Senator Harris responded with a bland endorsement of the two-state solution. Quoting her here, I believe that Israel is America's friend and that we should support Israel. And I also believe very strongly in a two-state solution and the need for doing everything we can to encourage that the leaders in that region move toward that end. That's a horrible response because you're saying nothing about the Israeli apartheid of, Palest of innocent Palestinians and creating settlements, building settlements on land that, be that belongs to Palestinians. But okay, that's not the most surprising response ever, but it's pathetic. Um, it says the audience member kept at it and Harris later released a transcript to Huffington Post of the meeting with pro-Israel student, students at the APAC conference in Washington on March 5th, 2018. So that's a long time ago. That was um, more than a year ago. So about a, a year and three months, 15 months ago. Um, the, re the remarkable element of the appearance is when Harris connects the civil rights struggle in the South, which her parents had participated in, quoting her, I grew up surrounded by a bunch of adults who spent full time marching and shouting about this thing called justice, end quote, to support for Israel. APAC's moderator asked Harris where her support for Israel came from, and the senator brought up the famous attempted civil rights march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma en route to Montgomery in March, in March 1965. So this is, quoting, this is quoting Kamala Harris here. It's pretty long, but stay with me. It was always part of my life. I grew up, we and maybe many of you, I don't know if anyone is still doing this with the vigor with which we would do it. But we would have, ha we would have our little boxes where we were raising money to plant trees for Israel. And then she laughs, I guess. And we would go around with our box. And you know, I actually never sold Girl Scout cookies, but I raised money to plant trees in Israel. So it was just, it's always been, it's always been there. 
I've been to Israel three times, most recently in November of last year. I promised friends and myself that I would go before the end of my first year as a United States Senator, and it is just something that has always been a part of me. I don't know when it started. It's almost like saying, when did you first realize you loved your family or love for your country? It was, it just was a, uh, it just was always there. It was always there. But I will also say something that connects to the earlier point that you made. So this weekend, in fact, late last night, I got back from Selma, from Alabama, and I was there with a bipartisan delegation of members of Congress to commemorate, not really celebrate, but commemorate the crossing of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which occurred 53, 53 years ago, and was notoriously because it was no... Hold on, hold on. And was highlighted because it was a notoriously awful, uh, notoriously awful day in what was called Bloody Sunday. Which is when a group of people that were black and white and brown and every color under the rainbow, a group of people that were ministers and rabbis, people of all ages from all areas of the country, $25,000 in, 25, in number by the third day that they tried to take that walk across the, that bridge, who marched together hand in hand to fight for everyone's civil rights and in particularly the right of African Americans to vote at that time. Okay, continuing on here, it's very, very long here. It says, and I would, ar and I would encourage us all to remember every aspect of our history as an indication again of who we are and what we must always recommit ourselves to be. Because the stories of what happened in those days for those marchers, and again, the incredible diaspora, likely transcription error, says in, in parentheses, of who we are as a country is a story of going to that bridge. Mostly the movement was by students, students. That movement was student-led. A young John Lewis who faced troopers who were on horses and those horses were trampling these young people who were marching for justice. They faced mobs, Clan members, Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan members who were telling them they didn't belong and they marched hand in hand. And I actually gave a speech over the weekend while I was there and I said, you know, the thing about the recognition of this bridge crossing is that the bridge crossing, they were crossing that bridge also while they were building bridges. And that gets back to our collective mission as leaders. We will cross bridges, we will fight, we will go arm in arm to make sure that we will always be a loud voice against bigotry and hatred and anti-Semitism. We will always march together proudly against all of those forces. That may seem, uh, all of those forces that may seem more powerful sometimes. Look at Charlottesville and that awful moment when we had to see people marching with torches and swastikas. But we will always remember. We will be strong in the face of that kind of hatred. It is not new. It will revisit itself. But we will stand together proud and in the process of standing up and fighting for equality and fairness and justice. We will always, I'm sorry, we will also commit ourselves to to building bridges. And that means building the coalition and building the connection between all of us to fight together. And that's on the issue of Israel. It's on the issue of so many challenges that we face as a world and the challenges we face as leaders. Building bridges, very important. So a lot of fucking platitudes and cliches there. It says, Harris also said that it's important to keep Israel not even a bipartisan issue, but a nonpartisan issue. She, is not she has not succeeded in that goal. It's coming up in the Democratic presidential primary already, which is the last thing APAC or the Democratic Party leadership wants. Though Harris voted earlier this, week, this month against a bill that would penalize supporters of boycott, divestments, and sanctions, which is BDS, thereby bucking APAC and the Israel lobby. Harris spoke to APAC in 2017 and said her contributions to, contributions to those little blue boxes had helped Israel make the desert bloom. Years later, when I visited Israel for the first time, I saw the fruits of that effort and the Israeli ingenuity that has truly made a desert bloom. Uh, I soaked in the sights and sounds and smells of Jerusalem. Um, it says the JTA has wondered why Harris grew up hawking those blue boxes. No mention why Harris was a blue box girl growing up, though Harris's husband, Douglas M. Hoff, is Jewish. Um, yeah, but, you know, Kamala Harris has always been, she's always been one of the, as far as I know, she's always been one of the biggest shills to APAC. Um, 
especially since being in the Senate. I don't know about before that. Before that, because uh, she was, you know, Attorney General, and then before that, she was DA of San Francisco. So it's a little bit um, tougher to gauge what her views were. Then I could check it, but um, honestly, that's pretty much irrelevant to her positions on as senator, especially when she's voting on legislation. You know, that's pro Israel and whatnot. But she did. It's good to see that she did at least vote against. Um, what was it against? penalizing supporters of the bds movement which is good that's a good thing but uh, I'm, I'm actually yeah i'm very surprised that she took that position i would like to see why he, she took that position um but it is good to see that was in january yeah that was january end of january 2019 so um but yeah so uh, but comparing comparing what the, the state of israel is going through with what the people that went through in selma alabama that's just disgusting i mean what a ridiculous comparison that is so absurd especially considering the fact that the people of israel are not the ones that are being killed and being bombed and hit with airstrikes by the by the israeli government they're not the ones that are Israel is not the ones that is suffering. They're, they're the ones that are launching the offensive attacks against Palestinians, against Palestine. They're destroying everything that in Gaza, West Gaza, all different parts of, you know, the the all the different areas that um, that Palestinians live. They're they're destroying all those areas. And when they're talking about and you know when they're they're talking about how they're victims, I mean, they easy, they have somebody like Kamal Harris and a lot of other politicians, you know completely defending them but i don't think i've ever heard anybody make the case that they're just like the people in selma alabama who were black people they were people of color all you know all these different people that were fighting for essentially democracy they were voting for the right to you know drink from the same water fountain as white people you know riding on the same buses as white white people not having to be forced to sit in the back of the bus you know being allowed to vote you know not allowing not a not allowing those people to do those things what does that have to do with israel but that's the thing the whole the whole goal here is is to portray israel as the victim is to talk about how israel is the victim of palestinians even though they're the ones doing these horrible things to palestinians but portraying them them as going through anti-semitism as them you know being the ones that are being you know being the ones that are that are suffering through something when they're not really suffering through that much other than okay maybe they you know it's you know there's definitely no argument that um the palestinians and um israelis are like you know they have a war essentially going on essentially essentially against each other but the war is so one-sided in the fact that there are so many palestinian um there are so so many palestinian um victims and men women children everybody you know and it's it's israel is allowed to do whatever it wants america fully supports them saudi arabia supports them even though they're killing arabs essentially and yet saudi arabia doesn't have anything to say about what they're doing iran has definitely spoken out they're always speaking out against israel no matter what but they've also sp spoken out against their again against israel's um actions against um against um the palestinians and what they're doing in gaza and you know but kamal harris is just a typical shill she's a shill to the israeli lobby she is a shill to the establishment and when you're and when the, when that's what you are you need to do what those people tell you what to, you know, tell you to do and if you don't you're going to be condemned strongly and you know voting against you know voting against what was it the bds the the bds legislation as far as um not uh supporting to penalize them one time that doesn't mean that you're fair um again i don't know what the basis of her um of her you know voting against penalizing supporters was but that's good that's one po good position you took that was not um in favor of what apac and the israel lobby wanted but that does not give you a pass whatsoever not even close so all the times that you've been on in the side of israel and shielding for them and and sucking up to them and you know you know there's a picture here of her meeting with benjamin netanyahu in 2017 and shaking his hand i think in another picture but this is just a picture of them two standing next to each other and i don't know smiling and shit like that's <sighs> she she's so 
uh, she's just so opportunistic and she this is why she wants to become president because she wants to do the bidding of apac she wants to do the bidding of the israel israeli lobby she wants to do what they want because she knows that those are the people that are going to be ultimately leading to her becoming the nominee and if you're somebody like bernie sanders who is jewish but does not support what what apac does you know it's it's good that's refreshing to see and he's one of the very few out there um i don't know if tulsi gabbard has come out against apac i think she's spoken out against what israel has done to APAC, uh, what israel has done to the palestinians but i don't know if she's against she's come out against apac though so <clears throat> you guys can fact check me on that one but um yeah she's not but she, you know kamala harris is not somebody that can be trusted she's way too opportunistic and she's way too um she's she's way too sneaky in these kind of things and you can't trust her to take any kind of position that's going to be true truly principled and truly the right thing and moral thing to do and how is she any different than republicans i mean republicans are always shilling to shilling uh, for israel they're always shilling for what the the israeli lobby in israel does especially when sheldon adelson is one of the biggest donors to the republican party because he's a right winger he's a conservative and he he's always donating to the uh, you know to the Republican Party. I don't know, maybe a couple of Democrats he's cool with. I don't know, it's possible. Yeah. So I mean, but Sheldon Allison is a right winger though. Either way, it doesn't matter. He's a fucking right winger. So, and if that's the guy you know that you want to be affiliated with, that that guy who supports Israel and all the Republicans that support Israel, you want to be you know a member of the Democratic Party, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, you know Cory Booker, all these people. If you guys want to be supporting Israel along with the Republicans on this ridiculous issue of you know being allowed to kill innocent palestinians men women women and children then go ahead but you're not going to get any that's just another reason for you not to get support from progressives like myself and all the people out there that already can't stand the the positions that you take So let's do the last article here. This is um, concerning uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her characterization of the um, detention camps on the border who are detaining detainees, I'm sorry, who are detaining um, children and putting them in cages, let alone just, you know, grown-ups who are immigrants, but they're putting children in cages. And this was something that uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez referred to as concentration camps. And this got a big uproar, as usual, from um, from the, the right-wingers and from the Republican Party. A lot of people, I think, called it anti, maybe anti-Semitic or kind of downplaying what happened in, in um, Nazi Germany and, you know, different... Um, countries that were taken over by by the nazis poland and whatnot so this is an article from the new york post um uh it pro it's profiling the comments of a holocaust survivor a 93 year old man who was a holocaust survivor who referred to um aoc alexandra ocasio cortez in not so uh not so flattering terms um, so let me read you guys the title here. It says, um, quote, Nobel Peace Prize in Stupidity. Holocaust Survivor Wants AOC Out of Congress. So this is from the New York Post. And this New York Post is owned by Fox, is owned by um, 20th Century Fox News Corp, which is the same own, same people that um, own um, Fox News. Rupert Murdoch is the CEO. And so New York Post is obviously going to be anti, you know, liberals, Democrats, AOC, all those people. So they um, profile this, uh, you know, Holocaust survivor is going after AOC here. So let's read the article here and we'll discuss it a little bit here. It says, there are a few um, remaining survivors of concentration camps. Ed Mossberg is one of them. And the 93-year-old from Morris Plains, New Jersey, has no time for Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's statements last week when she called the southern border's migrant detention camps concentration camps. Quote, she should be removed from Congress, 
She's spreading anti-Semitism, hatred, and stupidity, Ma Mossberg told the, the Post. The people on the border aren't forced to be there. <laughs> they go there on their own will. If someone doesn't know the difference, either they're playing stupid or they just don't care. On June 18th, the Bronx slash Queens politician posted a video on Instagram in which she said, quote, the United States is running concentration camps on our southern border, and that is exactly what they are. What they are. They are concentration camps. Mossberg, who lost his entire family during the Holocaust and himself survived both the, Plaz the Plazau and Mothausen, Sorry if I'm misstating though or mispronouncing those. Mothausen camps said, quote, her statement is evil. It hurts a lot of people. At the concentration camps, we were not free. We were forced there by the Germans who executed and murdered people. There is no way you can compare. On June 21st, the Holocaust education group from the depths of which Mossberg's, Mossberg is the president, extended an invitation to AOC via Facebook, encouraging her to tour German Nazi concent concentration camps with Mossberg. He said he hoped to take her to the museum and memorial site at Auschwitz, where his mother was murdered. But when other members of Congress um, encouraged the freshman representative to take Mossberg up on the offer, AOC publicly declined. She tweeted to, rep to Iowa Rep Representative I Steve, Qu Steve King, quote, the last time you went on this trip, it was reported that you also met with fringe Austrian neo-Nazi groups to talk shop. So I'm going to have to decline your invite. But thank you for revealing to all how transparently the far right manipulates these moments for political gain. Following a 2018 trip with, uh, with From the Depths, King reportedly met with a group founded by a former Nazi SS officer. Mossberg said he was very disappointed by AOC's rejection. Quote, she should be taught a lesson. If you're not there, you will never know what happened. She doesn't want to learn. She's looking for excuses. I would like to nominate her for the Nobel Peace Prize, or Nobel Prize in, in not Peace Prize, Nobel Prize in Stupidity. AOC's rep told the Post, "quote She made a distinction between a death camp and concentration camp. She's been pretty outspoken about the issue. If she accepts the offer, his offer, the non agrarian said he would personally give her a tour of camps." I can show, quoting Mossberg, I can show her where they killed my mother, my grandparents, and cousins, so she understands this, he said. I will bring her to the place where they gave my wife's mother benzene injections to the heart and put her on the fire. Mossberg, who was in Krakow, Poland, born in Krakow, Poland, witnessed unspeakable horror during his teenage years. I saw people being hung, being beaten to death, attacked by dogs. I was laying on the ground. The Nazi guards were trying to kill me. A badly beaten uh, Mossberg had nearly lost the uh, will to live by the time he was liberated by American troops. I didn't want to leave, he called. I didn't know where to go. He spent months in an Italian hospital before immigrating to the United States with his wife, also a survivor, in 1951. They settled in Harlem, and he eventually became a real estate developer. He still wears a camp prisoner's uniform during lectures, quote, so people remember. Mossberg said, "The father of three and grandfather grandfather of six has been a back has been back to the camps dozens of times and helped lead educational tours, including last year with Republican and Democratic members of Congress at Auschwitz. From the depths of, I'm sorry, from the depths has taken 20 members of Congress, including New York Caroline Maloney, on its ed educational tours." They were very shaken and upset learning about the torture, torment, and murder, he said. They think every congressman should be should go to see it. She, AOC, doesn't want to go. Unless you go into the dark place, you can't understand it. Eventually, you will see she will lose all the Jewish vote in New York. So this guy um, obviously went through unspeakable torture, unspeakable um, experiences where he was, obviously his family was killed and everything. But that does not mean that the term concentration camps is owned only by the people that were in those concentration camps <clears throat> in the concentration concentration camps in in those so in you know Nazi controlled areas. So just because that term was used there, it does not mean it cannot be used anywhere else.
So that's an absurd case to make, let alone the fact that when you claim that the people that are crossing the border, he might be a Republican by saying this, I don't know, but it seems like he would be. But when you're saying that the people that are crossing the border are not forced to be there, that's not true. Now, you can say, yeah, they are not forced to cross the border. Well, they are, but I mean, they're not, I mean, they can stay in, in Central America, Mexico, wherever they are. That's true, but they're leaving because they're escaping the torture of what the drug, of what the drug wars and the drug cartels are, are creating in that region. So they have to leave. Otherwise, they're going to get killed. So, of course, they're forced to leave. And then, not only are they forced to leave, but then they're captured by the border control in, you know, somewhere in between Central America and Mexico, in the Mexican border, and they're, they're captured, and then they're put in detention centers. As I read in, an, I think it was an article last week when I was talking about how the Democrats capitulated to the Republican uh, anti-immigration policy, um, the, the uh, children that are put in cages are kept there for 90 days. They're kept in cages for 90 days. They're forced to eat, drink out of toilets, I, f I found out, which was something that AOC mentioned in, a, in an article, uh, I think it was in articles I read somewhere, or maybe it was a news report or something, but she was talking about how they're forced to drink out of toilets. And because she she toured the the border the border you know the ten, the detention sites in, in the you know where the border you know the border detention sites essentially and she um, toured those and you know along with a lot of other mem members of Congress and politicians obviously I doubt there was any Republicans there but um, she toured with uh, those people and she saw that and she reported and you know that's why she's saying that's the, that's what it was like now granted. The people at the border, the border detention sites are not being, they're not being hung. They're not being, I don't know if they're being, they're probably being beaten. I wouldn't be surprised, but they're not being hung. They're not being lit on fire, but that doesn't mean it can't be a concentration camp. Again, when you're talking about a concentration camp, that, that title, that term is not fully relegated to just what the, you know, what Jewish people went through in, in those concentration camps, like the, the concentration camps in Nazi, Nazi controlled regions. You don't own the copyright or the trademark of that term. So you can refer to it whatever you want. But the point is, is that, um, that what, what these Mexican immigrants and what these Hispanic immigrants are going through in, in these border, border uh, detention centers is bad. It's horrible. They shouldn't have to go through it. And just because um, they're not suffering the same exact to the, to the letter, to the bone, uh, you know, shit that the, you know, that the um, Jews were suffering through in, in Nazi, in, in the Nazi controlled uh, regions of Poland and Germany and different, you know, whatever, whatever other parts of, you know, parts of Europe that, that were controlled by Nazis, just because the people in the detention camps are not suffering through that doesn't mean that they're not suffering through anything. That doesn't mean you should uh, downplay that. Nobody's downplaying anything. It's not like Ale Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is saying that, oh, well, what the the, the people in the concentration camps in Auschwitz and, and, you know, Poland and Germany and all those different places, what they went through doesn't mean what they went through is nothing. And, you know, it should be downplayed and it should be, uh, you know, we should pretend as if it was nothing. Nobody is saying that all she is saying is that what the people in those detention centers on the in, on the border or near the border are going through it's terrible and they shouldn't have to go through that and it should be it should be if you're like again if you care about human life you're moral you're a moral person you care about the what people are going through you know when they're trying to you know they're trying to get away from essentially well, in that case, uh, if you want to call it terrorism or you want whatever you want to call it, you want to call it, you know, obviously what the drug cartels are going, th what the drug cartels are doing. I mean, it's certainly a form of terrorism. It's a form of, you know, because they're going around just murdering people for no reason, raping them and whatnot, I think, too. So, but whatever they're doing to the people <clears throat> on the border, those people have to get away from that. Just like the, the people in, in uh, Germany and Poland, they have to get away from the to the you know the they will have to get away from Hitler and the the way the not the Nazis are, are treating them they have to get away from them and you know they have to immigrate somewhere right the ones that couldn't make it out they had to be forced into concentration camps but the ones that were able to get out they had to get out 
And you should be understanding the fact that, okay, the people that are going through, um, that, that are trying to cross borders in, you know, from Mexico into the United States, for example, or any country, and trying to cross borders and get away from those drug cartels and those murderers, they're going through almost, almost the same thing, if not the same exact thing youth went through. Those same exact people that, were, that are in Germany and Poland and all those countries, they went through the same exact thing. So they should be, this guy should be understanding of that. So I don't know why he's lashing out at AOC for, for referring to horrible conditions um as being horrible but no he wants to portray he wants to portray as only his experience what his experience was as being the only bad thing nobody else what no what anybody else went through is nothing compared to what he went through okay i mean i guess you could say maybe it wasn't as bad i don't know i don't know what the people in the border detention facilities are going through if it's as bad as what this guy went through and what all you know millions of other people went through that were um that were uh, kept in those concentration camps but you can't say that it was uh, that that what the people on the on the on the border in those deten detention camps are, are are is not is nothing. You can't say that. I mean, that's just honestly the guy is being a dick, and he's obviously doesn't give a shit about uh, his fellow man, his fellow human. After going through such a horrible experience, you should be on the side of people that are going through this. It, I guarantee you. If, honestly, I guarantee you, majority of the people that went through what they um, went through regarding. Um, so when they went through, you know, you know, being in those concentration camps, dealing with the with the Nazis, you know, who were who were keeping them in those in those horrible conditions, I honestly, if you would ask them those people right now, I think they would be very understanding. I don't know how many of them are still alive. Obviously, according to the article, there isn't that many uh, people that survived the Holocaust alive and were you know in those concentration camps, but. Um, those, you know, I'm sure that if you ask those people, they would be understanding of the people that are that were that are being kept in these detention camps in, uh, you know, on the border. Why wouldn't they be? It, again, if you're a decent human being, you're understanding of what your fellow human being is going through. If you're just going to downplay and act like it's nothing, then honestly, you're not a decent human being. You're just a you're just an asshole, in my opinion. That's just the way I see it. And. What you went through is horrible, of course, but that doesn't mean you should downplay anything else, any, anybody else's experiences. Because again, you don't hold a trademark on the term concentration camps. You don't hold a trademark on, you know, on mass, uh, mass killings and, you know, uh, you know, what was it, extermination, nothing like that, you know? Granted, the people that are in those borders and the people that are obviously going through what they're going through on the, you know, dealing, having, having to try and get away from the drug cartels, that's not necessarily like mass extermination. But I mean, it, what they're going through is terrible. Just make that acknowledgement. You could easily say, okay, it wasn't as bad as what the people in the concentration camps went through, but it was still bad. And I'm an understanding of what they, of what they suffered with, and I, I stand by them, and I, they're human beings just like myself. But no, this guy wants to grandstand, and he wants to say, "Well, no, you don't get to say that because uh, what I went through was really, you know, was really bad, and what you went through is nothing, essentially." So I don't have any understanding of what you went through because what I went through is uh, so much worse than what you went through, and I have zero consideration and zero sympathy for what you, so what you did. Or, you know, what, what you had to suffer through. So uh, that's what it seems like he's saying, because he didn't say anything about, maybe he is understanding of what they went through, but he's not saying it because he's too busy responding to Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and getting offended by her words. So he wants to go out there and talk about how, she, you know, he's very offended by what she said without even de without even getting into what the, the people on the border are going through, even though he went through horrible conditions himself, even worse than what the people on the border are going through. But even if you go through even like a fraction of what the people in, in the Nazi camps and the concentration camps went through, if you went through even a, a, a fraction of what, that, of what those people went through, you should be understanding of that. And if you're not, honestly, you're, you're, you're tone deaf. You're tone deaf and you uh, honestly don't give a shit about anybody but yourself. And that's, what, and that's the impression that I'm getting from this guy. All right, guys, that's going to be the end of our episode today. Thank you so much for joining us. Sorry about the uh, technical difficulties that I had um, on on Periscope. I apologize for that. That was um, totally unexpected. It happened one other time. Luckily, it hasn't happened uh, up until now. So hopefully um, that wasn't too much of a burden. Um, but um, I, I really appreciate you guys joining us. Um, 
Obviously, we're going to be back next week uh, for another podcast covering some more important issues. Before I get going, I just wanted to let you guys know to please check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash prog blacksmith. If you could please become a contributor and uh, or a patron, uh, you know, add a contribution there, I would really appreciate that. And um, I'll see you guys next time. Take care.